Thank you for this moment of caring. We now enter the phase of the afternoon of the high-level panels, the three sessions in a row, one hour each. And I'm delighted to announce the speakers and the moderators in a minute. But what we will do for the first time, I guess, ever at the IGF is trying to really let you all participate digitally. We have a great, uh, well-working tool for that. It's called Slido. It might be well known amongst you, and you can connect now, if you were so kind to take out your smartphones, on three ways. Either you use your QR scanner to scan that QR code, or you can just, if you have a modern smartphone, you may just use your camera and uh, make a photo of that, and you'll be directly connected to Slido. And then it will open up the browser, and you're invited behind the hashtag to put on the code, which is, not surprisingly, IGF 2019. And what we are trying to do, I said it earlier, we have more than 2,000 people in the room, and we have people who are collaborating via Zoom, which is another tool, at the remote hubs, we will gather all your questions. And please apologize, we are not able to bring them all to the table in one hour of discussion with six panelists and a great moderator. But what we are going to do, and it's very, very highly appreciated by the IGF and the team behind to know about your questions and your expertise behind. So please don't hesitate to send us your questions, although we will only be able to put a few of them on the plate. That will happen in the last third of the discussion. Um, send me a smile or anything like that if you're in, that I know, is it working out, more or less? So whenever you want, you can you drop your uh, question related to the panel. So I'm handing over the moderation now for the first high-level session, which is on the future of internet governance. And I'm handing over, and I'm very much inviting now all panelists, please, on stage, together with the moderator. I start with introducing the moderator. It's Vince Cerf. He's an American internet pioneer recognized as one of the fathers of the internet, vice president and chief internet evangelist at Google. He has received numerous honorary degrees and awards that include the National Medal of Technology, the Turing Award, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, and many more. Okay, I'll leave it here. Yeah? Too good to have you here. Vince, which, whatever seat you are, may I introduce your panelists, if, if I wish. Um, please, come on stage. Please, please. I start with, Sim, uh, with Sir Tim Berners-Lee. His visionary and innovative work has transformed almost every aspect of our lives. The Time magazine named him one of the 100 most important people of the 20th century. He invented the World Wide Web in 1989 and later became the founding director of the World Wide Web Foundation, which seeks to establish, that's the subject of the day, uh, the net as a global public good and basic right. And in this interest, I don't know of who of you was uh, uh, testifying this yesterday, he launched the contract of the web at the IGF yesterday. Too good to have you here. And um, I, I start with a lady in the back, because Andriette Esterhuisen, can you come please to the front? Oh, that's not Andriette. Okay, sorry, I was wrong. So I start with uh, the other ones. This is Goran Marby. He's the CEO and the president of ICANN since 2016. Uh, he's a member of the Swedish e-identification board with more than 20 years of experience as a leader in the web and tech sector. Please, have a seat. I follow with Liu Zhenmin. He's the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs at the UN. He advises the Secretary General on three pillars of sustainable development, social, economic and environmental, and he nurtures key partnerships with governments, UN agencies and civil society organizations. I go ahead with Makiko Yamada. He's the Vice Minister for Internal Affairs and Communications in Japan. And since summer 2015, she has been the General Director of the Global ICT Strategy Bureau in the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication. And earlier, she had become the first ever female Executive Secretary to the Japanese Prime Minister. Most welcome. 
So, and over more. Uh, so, could you please introduce yourself? There was a change in, would you be so kind? Please, please, this, the mic is on. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Alison Gilwald. I'm from Research ICT Africa and the University of Cape Town in South Africa. Um, I'm an academic and a researcher and a policy um, uh, researcher. I have been involved in policy and regulation across the African continent. Thank you very much. <laughs> and finally, Ignacio Cassis, the head of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Switzerland. Most welcome. Please, have a seat. Enjoy the conversation now. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it turns out that uh, we've done a little bit of research uh, about some of our panel members, and so I thought I would share a few secrets that we've discovered. Uh, we've discovered that uh, Vice Minister Yamada has joined a, uh, a gospel lesson uh, group, and she takes singing lessons twice a month. Her favorite song is called The Latter Will Be Greater, but her other favorite song is Oh Happy Day. And let's hope that at the end of this conference, we will all be singing Oh Happy Day. So welcome to the panel, thank you. Uh, it also uh, turns out that uh, Tim Berners-Lee, to my left, uh, we found another secret that he shared. He says he likes trail running and he's been known to update open street map while he's running, sometimes in Berlin. So I hope that you didn't run into anything while you were updating, Tim. Uh, we also discovered that uh, Mr. Goran Marby, to my right, uh, is a secret chef. He's an educated chef, and that explains why the projects that he starts have names like calzone, strawberry, Hubba Hubba and Milky Way. I'm sorry that uh, I do not have any other secret. Oh, I'm sorry, I have one more secret I've discovered. Yes, this is, um, this is uh, Mr. Cassis, who is the uh, head of the Department of Foreign Affairs in Switzerland, is actually a physician who practices preventative medicine. And it seems to me that that practice will be very relevant to what we talk about today, which is internet governance and its future. We would like to prevent disease and promote health in the internet. Under Secretary Jamin, I have no secrets. Do you wish to share any? I'm very transparent. <laughs> I'm very transparent, he says. Uh, and uh, Allison, I don't know if you have any secrets that you'd like to share. It's not required. Uh, would you like to use the microphone? I was actually asked. Yes, it's on. I was actually asked at short notice to share something fun about myself. Oh, well, then you're welcome to say something fun. I can tell frankly that there's actually nothing fun about me. <laughs> well, let us get started with the subject at hand, which is the future. <laughs> microphone is not on. Uh, no, 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 no secret. Like how, many, yeah, how many engineers does it take to turn on a microphone? <laughs> well, let's start uh, with a few observations. The, the specter of a fragmented and divided internet, sometimes called splinternet, where markets are corrupted and people's free expression is censored and democracy is undermined, is no longer just an abstract concept. It's a rapidly evolving reality. Cyberspace is a global space, and we need global solutions to our shared challenges. If we don't find flexible, future-proof international government's frameworks for the global internet, all of its promise and potential to lift up new voices and create new economic opportunities for everyone will cease to be global. And even in the places where the internet does continue to work in the same way that it does today, without a global reach, its value as a socioeconomic innovation engine will diminish. The open and interoperable internet is the foundation upon which many new and existing businesses are built. It's also uh, something upon which everyone who participates 
in the digital economy, small companies, uh, civil society, governments, and everyday users rely. And it's vital that this infrastructure functions reliably, safely, securely, accessibly, and affordably. Governance matters must receive priority attention, especially those affecting individual users and rights. I could go on, but I'm not going to do that. I think it's much more important for us to engage in discussion and to find out what questions you who are here assembled have for this panel. So I have a few, and I would like to start uh, with Mr. Cassis. What's your general view on the future of digital cooperation, and why has Switzerland been so committed to the UN Secretary General's high-level panel? Danke, Herr Vorsitzende. Ich werde zu Beginn Deutsch sprechen zu Ehren dieses. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will start speaking German to honor our host, and I will then switch to English. Dear panelists, ladies and gentlemen, digital transformation changes our world and in the technologies of digital transformation have to focus on the humans. Everybody has to be able to benefit from digital transformation. There may be many risks, but there are even more opportunities. Digital tr um, transformation um, can promote security and prosperity. And of course, as any change, this change creates fears and concerns as well. Our working lives are changed and artificial intelligence may soon trump our human intelligence, but many of these concerns are unfounded. Because we know that countries with a high degree of robotization have um, the lowest degrees of unemployment. Two things are quite clear to me. First, more interdisciplinary cooperation is required. And second, we need to strengthen international governance in this area. The expert dialogue at this IGF is necessary, but it alone is not enough. We need to bridge technological experts and decision makers in policy and industry. And this is why IGF could, should be further developed and include all stakeholders. Political decision makers have to, or decisions have to be measured against specific outcomes in terms of uh, social and economic outcomes. Our country supports the IGF. Um, just think of Doris Leuthardt and Vince Cerf. Switzerland um, advocates a multi-stakeholder approach. We want industry to be on board, policy world, but also academia and the general public. And they should decide how digital transformation should be um, used to the benefit of all. I would like to call this the Swiss approach because we are a country that practices direct democracy, so we are familiar with that. There are many good examples of multi-stakeholder approaches. For example, the Geneva Dialogue on Responsible Behavior in Cyberspace. The Swiss Foreign Ministry launched this dialogue last year with the objective to bring um, businesses from all over the world into a dialogue and come up with guidelines for action. And the Peace Institute and the Geneva Science S, uh, Institution are um, going in the same direction. They already play an important role in global digital policy. And we would like to even expand that to turn Geneva into a hub of the global digital transformation and technology debate. Thank you. 
appears to me that uh, some of the members of the panel would like to uh, make a few opening remarks, and uh, I overlooked that. And so uh, may I ask whether you would like to add anything to what you just said, or would you like that to be an opening statement of position? No, this was the opening statement. Wonderful. In that case, uh, let me ask uh, Under Secretary General uh, Liu Zhenmin to make his opening remarks, please. Thank you. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, you asked me what was my secrecy. Yes. I'm, I'm very transparent. Actually, I have a legal background, diplomatic career, and multilateral experience. This is my life. So it's, uh, we are commemorating uh, 50 years of the internet and 30 years of the invention of the website, www. Then the 14 years of uh, IGF. So, but we have to be honest to say that be, we are still left behind in internet governance. I think we can find that be IGF pro has proven to be the most uh, constructive and uh, successful platform, multi stakeholder platform. But I think it be, but due to the complexity of the issue itself. I think this is understandable that we have left behind. But it doesn't mean that we should really be satisfied with this part. In view of the future, I think that be what, what is the future? What is the future of internet governance? Gradually, I think we need to have some imagination. If you, when said, be, allow me to have some imagination, because in my career, I think I have evolved in formulating many of the rules from Antarctic, oceans, seabed mining, fisheries, outer space, many of the issues. But I think actually I'm a layman on the internet, but I think if you could allow me to see a few words, that'd be what I'm thinking. I think definitely for we need uh, open, inclusive uh, internet system. So I, I have to figure out if in the future uh, the most stakeholders could agree, we should really start to think of the future governance of the internet in three, on three pillars. First, we need a grid system that could take care of concerns of multi stakeholders that could safeguard the global internet connectivity and the cybersecurity, that could facilitate the sustainable development of all countries, and that could accelerate human progress. So, means that we, we need the rule of law, not the rule of jungle. It, it, that should be benefit for all and safe for all, but accept the evils. So, so second pillar, I think we need to gradually think of how we could really have accumulated a different set of rules for regulating different areas of in, internet-related activities. For example, how we address common technological criteria, common rules of internet operations, shared responsibility to respond to cyber crimes, Respect of, of, for innovation. This must be safeguarded. Respect uh, of intellectual property. Respect of human rights standards. Respect of different culture and civilizations, etc. Third pillar, I think, would be really we need the rules. Rules could include relevant the rules of the existing international law, and Secretary General highlighted that some of the rules existing international should apply, as well as I think to be, uh, there should be newly formulated guidelines or criteria. But we should not be ambitious to aim at negotiating anything. This is not, not time for negotiating anything. Uh, that's why I think for, we need the enhanced internet collaboration. 
with a different <laughs> internet institutions. So it's a, that's why I think the IGF would be most ideal platform. You know, if you go back to United Nations, United Nations could really build up its support to the IGF process. But we need to continue to maintain the, the multi-stakeholder process. This is the way out. If, if that leave to the member states only, I know that the members are divided. You know, in the UN committees, General Assembly committees, in the first committee on, on cybersecurity, they are divided among member states. In the third committee of the General Assembly on uh, uh, combating uh, uh, cyber crimes, member states also divided. That's why, but I think we should avoid that. If members continue to divide, we can achieve nothing in reaching any conclusions, reaching any solution. So that's why I think it's better that we make good use of IGF continuously, continue to mobilize the support of the multi-stakeholder process. But I'm afraid that be in our presence here today, over 2,000 participants, I think the majority are from uh, civil society, uh, industrial sector, and academia. We need to continue engaging more government representatives to be here in the future. So in the next six years, uh, until 2025, the World Summit of Internet Society is going to review the IGF. We need to continue to build up the IGF, make the IGF more effective, more efficient, so that to, to develop some uh, guidelines, so to live up to expectation of the international community. Thank you. Thank you. I think we uh, thank you very much. That gets us off to a very good start. Tim, I see you grabbed the microphone, so why don't I ask you if you have some opening mar remarks to make. If we can keep them to about three minutes, that would be helpful. So, uh, so I was asked, in fact, uh, I was told that I would be asked a, uh, a question about access. Well, I will uh, ask well, you about that, but you're welcome to use well, that as your me, opening let remark. Me do, let me do both, uh, as we have limited time. All right. uh, let me talk about, so, uh, yes, yesterday, uh, here we launched the contract for the web uh, and that is the result of, uh, of a year of multi-stakeholder uh, fairly effective uh, working groups uh, and so on coming together with the three parties, the, um, governments, companies and individuals and those who represent them all coming together to try to uh, work out what to do about the or issues which the first two speakers this morning uh, have fortunately very uh, well laid out for us already. So, uh, so the so the multi yes multi stakeholder and uh, getting down to working groups is a is a way to do it. The result, for example, has been uh, the the Web Foundation, for example, when it comes to access. Just when we talk about first simple access, just the fact that at the moment. Over half, but only just over half the planet has any connectivity at all. We have said, because the issue is now not the cost of devices as it used to be, it's now just the cost of the plan. And so we have said, you should be able to get one gigabyte per month for less than 2% of the mean monthly income in your country. And so that has been, and so that is, that's been the Web Foundation's uh, one for two uh, rule. The Broadband Commission also has picked up that uh, one for two rule, and it's interesting to see which countries are taking that. So the basic level, yes, we need to push for, to get internet and all these, all the issues that we're talking about, we're important talking about today, these people won't yet have, because they won't have it. Is have the internet. So that, if you like, is very primary. But also, what we said at the Web Foundation is we're not meaningful connectivity. So if you go through the process of, select, of applying for a job, and then the final piece is, okay, now upload a video of yourself uh, to, uh, explaining why you want the job. And you've done all that you've done up to that point on a low bandwidth line, but, and then in fact you, you know that you'll never be able to upload a video because your, uh, co your connectivity will never do it, then you're sunk. So in fact there are times when you do need, you need 
uh, not more than just a connection, you need a reliable connection, you need a, a reasonable bandwidth both way, in both directions uh, because video conferencing with your, uh, is so powerful. Uh, so you need a, a, you need a, a connection which is, uh, which is neutral, which allows you to connect to anybody. And so not just connectivity, meaningful connectivity. And then when you've uh, got that connectivity, as more and more people do get online, and of course, hopefully, even though the, the, alarmingly the number of people getting online was increasing at 20% per year a few years ago, and now it lost last year it, it increased at only 5% per year. So the actual rate, that percentage rate is going down. So, but we can assume that people will get online. There will be more people online, and as more and more people are online, we must be concerned, is this the web we want? All of the concerns that we've seen in the developed world with people who are online, all the concerns about truth, science, democracy, all at risk, the, the ways by which humanity decides what to believe and humanity decides what to do collectively uh, are all at risk partly because of a broken web. And so we need, the, we need to fix those uh, very importantly, uh, and so the contract for the web is uh, a big part of that, um, laying out for the first time a global plan for doing that. So let's thank you so much, uh, Tim. I think that that sets the stage for uh, our work that uh, lies ahead. Gern, uh, would you like to take a moment to uh, share your thinking at the outset? Thank you. Actually, I decided I'm going to reveal another secret as well. Um, it might be illegal, so don't tell anyone. 30 years ago, we, one of my friends and mine, we borrowed my father's car. We drove down to Berlin and we stole a piece of the wall and drove back home again. <laughs> Please don't tell anyone. <laughs> I mean, so to be able, if you define a problem, if you define a solution, you may sometimes actually agree on what the problem is. And I, I think that the part of the where Internet Governance Corp is that we have to agree what the problem is. Because internet as itself is not governed in the traditional way. We're not a stock exchange, we're not a treaty. We exist through corporations around the world. And internet's also sort of two layers in that sense. You have the accessibility of the internet and you have platforms on top of the internet. And right now, many of the discussions that arises around the internet is actually about the uses of private data in some of those platforms. And for me, coming from ICANN, that's not really the internet. I mean, the funny thing with the internet is that no one owns it, and, and everybody owns it. I mean, you all have your own personal internet, um, and you can define your own internet by, by having your own, uh, you go to your own websites, you can create your own websites, you can use your social media and, and put content there. It's very much personalized. I think that a lot of the future is, is about what we haven't done. I mean, many times we talk about internet is done. We sort of, now we just going to fix it. Sometimes it's even a negative discussion, which I don't really agree with because I think internet's a very positive force. When you bring people together on this gigantic networks of networks, something magical happens. That's what we believe. But it's going to change and it has to change because the next billion users will not be the elites of the world. They will not live in cities. Um, they will come from totally different places. They will not have English as their, as their, as their native language or even an understanding of it. They want to use the internet according to their values and their principles and their needs. And frankly, they will not have an, you know, the, the financial means that many other people have had uh, so far. And, and just talk about the, the fact that it has to be in, in local scripts so you can use your own keyboard. It's going to be mobile more than fixed networks and so on. And I, I think that we, who's been around for a while, some much longer than me, um, we have to take into account that the governance, and when I speak now to the governance model of the internet, I actually talk about the internet itself, not the platforms on top of the internet. I think we, I think we basically have to rethink a lot of those models, uh, economical models, financial models, because if we think that the internet is a positive force for people to get online on, because they can get information and share information, we can't do the same thing we've done before because then we will never reach the next billion users who will be primarily outside cities in rural areas with less financial means. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Well, that sets the stage for some more debate.
Vice Minister Yamada, would you like to begin uh, with some of your opening remarks? Yes, it works. Yeah, it works. Okay, yeah. It's lucky. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, so, uh, talking about the, uh, the future of internet governance, so we uh, must uh, think that a data itself will be the source of added value and will drive our economy and society forward. And uh, in a world that has more or less accomplished the free flow of goods across borders, and uh, our next challenge will be the promotion of the free flow of data across borders. And uh, I, I'd like to introduce the discussion of uh, G20 this year because uh, Japan uh, ran the presidency of G20 platform. And uh, so my previous boss, uh, Prime Minister Abe, <laughs> chaired the G20. And uh, Japan focused on the free flow of data with trust uh, in the digital uh, society. And uh, this is the, a kind of consensus led to uh, so what we call Osaka track process at the leader, uh, national leaders level. And uh, so, uh, so wh what we should accomplish now is that the uh, free flow of data we trust and uh, it will uh, bring about the uh, growth of economy and the growth of the society. And so that's the, my opening remark. Thank you very much. I think this point about free flow of, uh, of information, free access, uh, doesn't mean free of charge necessarily, but it does mean freedom of choice, the ability to go where you want to go on the net to get to where you need to go, uh, to share information that, uh, that you believe is valuable for others. These are incredibly powerful notions. So, uh, Professor Gilabald, um, I would like to find out whether you have any opening thoughts as well for our panel. Thank you. Um, I, I do, I do. I think, um, you know, we've understood a free and open internet as something that we need to defend from, from regulation um, and from governance. Um, but in fact, I think what we're seeing more and more is the need to, um, you know, we have to defend the openness of it. We actually have to find ways of governing and protecting through regulation. It's, it's not this kind of libertarian, uh, you know, free market that we, you know, people can come and leave and et cetera. So I think, in order to have this discussion around you know, an open internet, we absolutely have to look at it more holistically. We can no longer just look at it as the sort of logical layer and the regulation of that. And I think what we're seeing is a failure of the various forms of international and global governance that we've had. And I think we're severely challenged now. I think we, we really have a crisis in global governance about how to deal with these things. And I think to deal with them holistically, but you, as we said, we can't have this discussion um, about an open internet with only 30%, you know, an elite 30% of the, of the globe's population. We have to have this discussion around the access issues, around the uh, you know, internet um, protocol issues, and of course around the data and platforms, because they're intrinsic to it. Um, you know, what we're seeing at the moment is the impacts of OTTs on infrastructure investments. We're seeing um, the taxation of poor people with social networking taxes um, in, you know, instead of taxing the platforms. So people's, you know, it's really impacting on, on people's ability to participate in this. People are actually coming off the net. So besides the stabilization that you're seeing, you know, people are actually being pushed off the net. And of course, because we can't just talk about the infrastructure any longer or the services on it, we're actually talking about the platforms and the content. These um, sort of traditional rent extractive processes by governments are coinciding with social control. So those are specifically geared because you know, young social dissidents are actually using those networks. Um, so there's this intersection of rights and um, economic regulation that we, not, we haven't seen before and that have to be addressed at a global level. The only way we can engage with governments who are, the, these are often the only industries from which they can get taxes. And so you know, making the poor pay is not the solution. So these global solutions, G20, OECD solutions around um, you know, a global platform tax that could be fairly administered, so not an irrational tax, a fair tax at a national basis, sort of kind of governance challenges we have to deal with. And I mean, just to, you know, we have to move, I absolutely agree beyond 
you know, the things we've been doing before that simply haven't been working. And I think, you know, we've had failure at the nation state level, at the multilateral level. We've, um, you know, worked with multi-stakeholderism. I think there's been an enormous progress in many ways. But multi-stakeholderism um, multi on its own is not delivering enough. We're still seeing enormous challenges in, in what is happening in the internet. And we've got to move beyond the slogans, you know. Um, devices are still the biggest challenge. Our evidence, you know, demand-side evidence shows that devices remain the biggest challenge. And those countries which have those very, very low prices, some of the lowest prices in Africa, actually also have the lowest internet penetration rate. So we need to look at this in a way, we need to actually find alternative access strategies. We also just have to, sorry, very quickly, just to have look at it at, you know, at these different levels. So what is actually happening with regulation at, at the different levels? We, we don't actually have, we have state failure, we also have private sector failure. So, you know, I think the model of ICANN and the private um, regulation of, of the internet, the, the, the sale of the .org um, domain name represents a significant challenge to private regulation. I mean, this should not have happened in a public, you know, regulatory um, regime. And so one can go on and look at the challenges of, you know, data governance with Cambridge Analytica and the platforms and that kind of thing. So this is a very integrated challenge that we really have to come up with new forms of global governance to address that will have to be collaborative. Uh, thank you, Alison. Uh, we need to leave a little time here for uh, some discussion. Uh, it seems to me, just based on what all of you have said so far, that the notion of a single regulatory regime is not going to work because uh, we have a very complex object that can be used in a variety of ways. And uh, the business models vary from layer to layer. Gurun was quite right, I think, to separate platform from the underlying communication network. But then, uh, Ellison, you mentioned also the applications that sit on top of the platforms. Every one of those, content and usage, introduces uh, a need for some kind of, uh, of uh, regulatory oversight or uh, pro you know, um, protection from harm. So perhaps the most important question that, uh, that we can ask, and I'd be happy to have any of you respond to this, is how do we approach this complex process uh, under Secretary Jamin, you mentioned that uh, you thought the multi-stakeholder element in the IGF was important for us to get on the table the, a, a variety of different approaches to uh, managing the development of governance processes. I wonder if you could say a little more about that. Yes, I think um, after 14 years, I think now it's a really time for IGF to really to underline the what, what real issues. We, can, we could have a list of issues. What issues we need to really develop some guidelines, some criteria, some rules. But you cannot have one, I agree with you, one uniform set of rules to address all issues. I think, for example, some technological issues not be, we, we can ask for ITU to address. Some, some rules, we can ask some other bodies. So this is, be, I think we, through the IGF process, we could really find the issues. And what be easy issues, we can start to follow, find some solution. Then we could really request and mandate a particular agency, organization, even some issues can be addressed by outcome, you see? It is some come by ITU, some come by, by UN self. Some by, it, it, I think we need to find different issues to be addressed by different. So, but definitely, IGF could serve as a platform for enhanced international collaboration. We need this international collaboration, but with the shared responsibility of different international institutions. So you mentioned shared responsibility, and it occurs to me that uh, the other people who have a responsibility to share are the users of the network because their behavior uh, determines in some sense what the internet is like and also whether or not it's uh, safe and secure or not. People who um, don't know how to secure their own passwords, for example, introduce significant problems for everyone, including themselves. And so this notion of shared responsibility feels like it might be an important plank in thinking. So, Tim, I'd like to ask whether that fits into the contract. Uh, is, are the users themselves part of this contract? 
Absolutely, they're very, very important uh, part of the contract. And part of it is uh, you're, uh, simply, straightforwardly, uh, you're, when you go onto the internet, when you go onto a social network on the web and you uh, start interacting with people, you actually have a choice in what you do. The way you react to something has enormous imp impact. If you react with, to the thing which, as you know, psychiatrists and tests will show, that you're more likely to react to something which makes you feel angry than to something which makes you feel, aha. Uh, if you suppress that, maybe put off that retweet till the morning, uh, and then, if, and in fact, think and or track the or the provenance of the thing that you're just about to uh, to pass on. So you can just have a huge effect on the quality of discussion out there by moderating what you say and what you retweet and what you like. Uh, and so, as an individual, that you can have a huge uh, huge effect. But also down the line, in a way, we can have multilateral agreements between. Well, companies and, and, and governments um, till we're blue in the face, but at the end of the day, somebody will... Uh, we set the system up for as much accountability and metrics as possible, but at the end of the day, as an individual user, you have to realize that it's got to the point where, no, the company which said that it would respect right, your, our, our rights in that way is not. The government which said it, which ought to be respecting our rights in that way, is not, and then you have to protest. And then you have to go down to you know, our times in the internet's history, like with Actor and Sopa and Pippa. People will have, you have to get that broom out, and you have to get that, <laughs> that piece of cardboard and the pen, and you have to, uh, you know, uh, so you also, you, yes, you have to use the internet in a quick way, but also as an individual, as a citizen, at the end of the day, you have to hold governments and companies to account. So, uh, and can I just yeah. respond to that? Because I, you know, I think this notion that um, people have the resources for that kind of agency is an assumption that we make from a position of, of privilege, that we can actually go onto the net, we know how to use it. Mm. I think this, you know, the, one of the major challenges we have as people, large numbers of marginalized people come online, is that they don't actually, they're unable to exercise those rights, even if they exist, even if they exist in codes of conduct, that they actually don't have the um, resources in order to, to exercise those roads, rights. And I think this notion that, you know, once we've dealt with the connectivity, we've actually got digital um, equality in a, in a data and a, you know, um, environment is not actually correct at all. I mean, I think one of the most wicked you know, policy challenges we have is this digital inequality paradox, that as we bring people more online, we're actually increasing inequalities, not only between the connected and the unconnected, but those people who are passively consuming tiny bits of data, you know, simply to make, and those who are actually prospering and creating businesses, doing those sorts of things. So I think we actually, we move beyond just, you know, individuals being able to get access, make the most of it, you know, put their best foot forward. We actually need public um, interventions that enable people to come online. This will enhance equitability. Um, and these are enormous challenges because, you know, the, the only way this can be addressed is at the global level. And we have this enormous normative dilemma um, between you know, clashing norm systems that make it very difficult to use those international forums to get agreement on, on how to proceed with these things. So uh, I actually wonder, Goran, whether uh, you have a, re a reaction to this. I'm tr looking for uh, something very concrete that we might do to move in the direction that, uh, that you're suggesting, but I'm, I'm not sure what that concrete step would look like. Also, this feels very local, and it's a, a global solution to a local problem sounds like it might be an interesting challenge. So let me first let's, let's go on and think about that for a moment. Thank you. I mean, as, yeah, where do I start? Um, there's many things said, and many things are interesting, and I think it shows to some extent that we always talk past each other. I mean, I happen to believe that the internet is not a major catastrophe that is thrown on the world. I happen to believe that the internet uh, is a good thing. Many years ago, um, I had a pleasure uh, of being in Latin America, and I, I was visiting a country, and I met a telecom regulator, and he told me that they were doing a, a, a connectivity to the rural area project. 
And I asked him, what, what, why did you do this? And, and I have to admit that I sometimes don't listen to the answer because the answer is often, yes, we're doing this so people can get jobs and an economy and, and all of that good stuff. And that's important. But do you know what he said instead? He said that access to information has always been the, the, the right for the rich people. By putting people online, you take away one of the biggest disadvantages of being poor. You have the right, you have the ability to reach the same information. And I don't think that, and for that is for me personally, one of the reasons why I'm doing what I'm doing at ICANN. And, and many of us who are, who are, are doing uh, what we're supposed to do. And I, I think that I, I'm, I'm, I don't like the negativism about the discussion. I think we are actually on an evolutionary path. So, yes, over the last, I mean, you all use internet, I presume, often, too often maybe, and it still seems to be working, you know, and, and you do a lot of things with it. But we sort of, we've done, and, and some gentleman here has experimented a lot uh, to reach where we are. And now we see that taking the next step, we have to do evolution and go forward. That doesn't mean for me that everything that was done up till now was bad. It's just that now we reach the point that we have to make some new decisions and find new ways. And I, I don't agree with the fact that everything is just a catastrophic thing and we have to blow everything up and it doesn't work. Because actually, you go home and you use your internet. And I do agree, but I do also agree, we need to train the end users more. Last year I was ridiculed when I said, you're on this stage a year ago, and I said, that, clean your underwear and clean your cash every week. Yeah, my, my press agent just got a hiccup again. I mean, <laughs> you have a personal responsibility for your own security on the internet. Thank you. So I agree with that. So, that I, I'm sure that you're elevating out of your seat. Um, yeah. do you, uh, would you like to respond? And I have another topic I want to bring up, so please briefly. I just wanted to respond. It's actually because the internet is so important. I mean, it's, that one wants to see these interventions, this equity, this um, making the um, you know, um, internet available for you know, digital economies in Africa for, to address unemployment. But that's, we've got to address these underlying issues. Otherwise, we simply, as I said, we, we exacerbate the inequality we don't. And I think the, the, the solutions, because these are global markets and these are global networks, um, the, the solutions will have to be global. And I think we, what we have to shift from is this notion that, you know, it's, um, it's, Africa that's a pro it's Africa's problem, or it's Africa, or it's people who are, are unconnected. What we need to do, as we did with national public policy, is treat the internet as a global public good. And therefore, it's the responsibility of all states, all members, all you know, agencies, etc., to take responsibility for it. The point you were making in point, apparently some vast percentage, I can't remember, of these um, malicious bots that are um, being directed around the world are being directed from unprotected phones in Africa. Because, you know, as a global good, cybersecurity is only as strong as its weakest link. So this is a, this is a global problem, it's an international problem that we have to address. I think it is, it's true that it's a global problem. But, but the solutions uh, have to be instantiated for every piece of the system. And this is not a uniform system. This is designed to allow thousands, tens of thousands of different networks to interconnect and interoperate. Uh, that's why it, we, they are not all 100% uniform. That was a deliberate design decision in order to allow this network to be future-proof, to ingest new technologies as they came along. So I think uh, you need to be a little careful, speaking as an engineer, uh, not to imagine that this is pure uniformity and therefore we can apply a single solution everywhere. Uh, I have some experience bringing internet services into Native American parts of the United States. It's a very rural part. And I can tell you that in every single case, the physical conditions and the economic conditions and the educational conditions dictate which choices we are able to implement in a sustainable way. So I, this is, we, we'll have to take some of this offline for the moment. Yes, Mr. Cassis. Yes, thank you, Chair. Maybe just uh, two words about that. Uh, this discussion shows how uh, huge the challenge is uh, uh, ahead. And um, therefore, we have to move to the next step, and the next step would be the option uh, IGF+. Um, Switzerland is convinced that uh, the IGS Plus has uh, the legitimacy to is legitimate to uh, 
to do this job uh, and uh, stays for all stakeholders, uh, stakeholders open and uh, has the right mandate to be developed further and further. So we think it is the, the best way to do that uh, and this discussion shows that it is not an easy discussion because all of each one of us has his mindset and his values and we don't have the same values all over the world. Um, Switzerland is prepared to support uh, the further development of uh, global digital cooperation and governance as proposed by the IGF Plus. Uh, and again, uh, I want to reiterate that uh, the International Geneva is predestinated to serve as a hub for digital governance and we are ready to support this uh, further development. Uh, we already have there many international actors who deal with many aspects of digital governance and uh, uh, I'm convinced that it presents a unique opportunity to uh, network these actors and uh, promote forms of interdisciplinary cooperation that are accessible to all. Um, I hope uh, that uh, we could find them the right biotope to make the step ahead we need to do. So I'm really glad to hear you say this. Now, for those of you who might not have seen the high-level panel on digital cooperation report, there were three options that we proposed that we could move forward in order to deal with the governance question. And the most well-developed, I think, in terms of uh, historical uh, fact is the IGF Plus model, because here we are after now 14 years. And so I'm glad to hear that, uh, that you're committed to that. I believe that's a very good uh, basis on which to move forward. So Vice Minister, uh, Vice Minister Yamada, uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts uh, on this topic or whether we could move into another one which I would like to ask you about. Okay, so uh, concerning the discussion uh, so far, I would like to point out uh, so two, two or three points. And one is that, uh, that the development of the, today's internet uh, has been the fruit of a multi-stakeholder approach. And the uh, harmony of the development of technology and uh, by engineers and private sector investment and social advocacy and institutional framework designed by the government. So we should not uh, forget that a multi-stakeholder approach is the core of the development of the internet. And the second is that as the internet is now the essential infrastructure of the society and economy, and the issue we are facing are becoming more diverse and complex. So, uh, so what is important is to define the type of each issue. So we should not confuse the technology issue with the policy issue. And the third point is that uh, the, uh, according to the, so the access uh, at the global level, uh, according to the data on an individual using the, in the internet provided by the ITU, uh, internet access is available to 80% of the population in developed countries, but only 20% of population in uh, the uh, least developed, uh, de so de developing countries. And so therefore, it is imp important to maintain digital infrastructure, especially in developing countries, in order to provide internet access to people all over the world. And uh, so uh, that's the idea that uh, we should regard the internet access as a kind of uh, human uh, fundamental right. Uh, so, and so we can discuss uh, on that point as well. So one could imagine uh, attempting to um, set up uh, a kind of challenge for all the countries of the world that uh, the, it is in their best interest to assure that the infrastructure is in place and that it's accessible and people know how to use it. I have the sense that there might be some outside questions coming. Kind of. Would like to ask it's, one, or do you, you know, want to? Uh, I have an iPad for you. All right. I, I guess you know how to handle it. I, well, okay. I don't know. It's Press black twice right now. the button. OK. So we have now parallel we are. Okay. questions. Can I just summarize some things that popped up? We got more than 172 questions. That's a bit too much for the next 10 minutes. Uh, there was one question, why don't we represent youth on the panel? There was a second remark on uh, there's 
not enough inclusion and um, yeah, the question of gender equality. But I can tell you that in the next panels, we will, I guess, in the last panel, double the, uh, the number of females. And so in the next one, we work up to that. <laughs> um, then there was another thing. Yeah, I deeply apologize, Alison, that I didn't know that you would be coming. There was the question, where is Henriette? And I, on I only learned that she was appointed this morning uh, by the Secretary General as the new chairwoman of the Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Board at the IGF. So that's why she sent. That's correct. So, yeah. Sorry that I didn't know that yet. So thank you very much for coming. So my, my first question is, uh, that's to all of you, it's coming from a member of the Kenyan Parliament. What is the future of parliaments in legislating internet governance? Can lawmaking keep up with the speed of digital advancement or will keep playing catch up? That was most favored by the audience as a question. Well, is there anyone who wants okay. to respond? Tim. Tim. Right, this, because in a way, uh, when you look, when I step back and look at the whole thing, the whole last 30 years of my uh, involvement basing on 20 years of Vince involvement, I see that when it comes to finding out where, whether something's true, typically, we, could, typically go, we go to Wikipedia, and Wikipedia is amazingly good. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's amazingly good. When we, find, when we want to have a debate, when we want to do democracy, when we want to have a, a, a political debate about what to do, instead of deciding what's true, we want to decide what to do, there isn't a go-to immediate place on the web where we all go to have this discussion. We can't just say, all right, that was nice on the discussion we had on the panel, but that thing about global injustice, let's take that to wiki poly, pol po politics. There are all kinds of social networks out there. They've been built to do all kinds of things. Okay, we haven't, what you see now is not what you will see tomorrow. Let us build systems out there which are effective which allow us to meet together, globally, connect together, to do all these multi-stakeholder things. Uh, let's build social networks, social systems on the web, which allow us to have a civilized debate, uh, allow politicians and everybody to be accountable, have a system whereby if I say something and I realize it's actually not true, it gets quietly voted down, like on Reddit, so on. <laughs> so let's, uh, you know, we have technology, uh, let's, uh, let's build socio-technical systems, let's, so let's, as we build the socio systems, let's also use technical tools uh, so that we have uh, much more effective democracies uh, out there, use them in small groups initially, like working groups, and let's find out which ones work well and then promote them so that eventually they can be used internationally. So let's, let's see whether we can get even closer. Now you've built some technology, so let's imagine the question now is whether parliaments are capable of keeping up with technological change. And it seems to me that the only way that can work is if the laws that are adopted have a certain degree of abstraction in them so that they are not so rooted in detail and underlying technology that they can't be properly applied to an evolving system. So, uh, yes. Uh. I, I think um, parliamentarians have a critical role in defending human rights underpinnings of internet-related issues that arise. I think part of our job is to demonstrate what um, you know, internet governance entails and how much of it actually doesn't, a lot of it doesn't happen through law and legislation. It's going to happen through this global governance and to get far greater participation of African governments in those global forums and more actively involved in those. But I think the, the, the role of um, informed parliamentarians, sufficiently informed on the technical aspects to be able to defend the human rights frameworks. At the moment we have cyber, cyber security laws in Africa, data protection laws, etc. that are not underpinned, you know, there, there's no reference, there's no human rights lens on these. And so I think it's the role of parliamentarians to interrogate those laws to ensure that they are um, compliant with you know, in, in United Nations um, frameworks. Etc. So it, it turns out that the, uh, um, the notion of IGF plus has inside of it an element of advice giving to governments looking for guidance with regard to policy. That's the one missing piece, one, it is a missing piece 
of the apparatus we have available. Where do governments go to get advice about how to cope with some of these technologies? I sense that you'd like to uh, move on to another question. Would I you? want to ask you, I bet you want to be first, please, and then I'll ask a question to you, Fins. I think when it be your last, in your last sentence, you mentioned also the internet, IGF plus. Actually, some, I, I, my understanding be some misunderstanding among the public about so-called the internet plus, IGF plus. I think IGF plus, the idea used by the high-level panel uh, uh, on digital cooperation. I think that, that my understanding of the, this IGF plus be, is not intention to create a new process, a new platform to replace IGF. No, no, that's it, not it, what it I seems to be the IGF plus, be, they are concerned where they find the platform to follow up their issues, their recommendations. They believe that be IGF might be also one of the choice of the platform to take care of some issues. Yes, we're not, we're not in that, disagreement. It doesn't mean we should, you should avoid it, but we are understand, interpret it, or we are going to create a new process, a new platform. No, I, I'm only suggesting that there be a place for governments to come to get advice. Anyway, you have another question. I have another question to you, Vinton. What will happen when we start to use quantum communications on the internet? Privacy will be finally given by default? Well, let's, first of all, there's a lot being conflated together. Um, quantum communication has to do with preserving the state of photons, for example, as they move from one quantum computer to another. Uh, if the uh, channel is in any way disturbed, the entanglement fails and the communication fails. And, uh, it, but that's, uh, some, somehow that question conflates an awful lot of stuff together. Quantum communication is mostly simply about being able to move an entangled uh, photon from one place to another, maintaining its state so that it can be used for further computation. Now, there is quantum communication used for key distribution in cryptography, and that's intended uh, to work in such a way that if someone is trying to snoop on the transmission, the transmission fails because the entanglement fails. Uh, but I don't think that the, that the question is well enough formed uh, to get beyond this very simple observation about the way in which quantum communi communication works. Mm -hmm. I want to drop another question. We are going to, uh, like heading to the final round that I leave in your hands. How do we regulate the decentralized internet of the future that is designed to resist censorship? Well, who would like to tackle that? Who would like to tackle that? <laughs> Well, I, I, can, I can start by saying that um, one way to prevent censorship is to allow people to communicate privately and uh, so that, in fact, their communications can't be interfered with. That suggests cryptography is part of the solution to that problem. So typically, it, it, it very much depends on what architecture for your, your uh, decentralized internet have. If you have something like Solid, which, uh, in which everybody, again, can have their own website. It used to be a thing. Everybody had their own websites, but now everybody has their own data stores, and they can store it wherever, where, with whoever they can trust. So to a certain extent, uh, sort of regu the, regulating that means that you're regulating a whole lot of different uh, storage you know, maybe schools and individuals will be running stores as well as huge companies. So what you can't do, you, then you have to be aware of that. You can't have a, a rule that says, uh, has t take down notices must be immediately Im implemented, you know, that assumes that all the lot very, very large companies are storing all, all the information. Uh, now it may be only stored by two large companies, so you assume that one of them can take uh, take it down in future if, if everything is decentralized and the storage is done by lots and lots of people uh, it'll be fine how to find those people uh, so uh, so uh, we need so let me uh, say one, one other thing another thing though that typically uh, yes we will encrypt everything so if uh, if I communicate with you then in general I hope nobody will be able to read what I say to you but on the other hand, my identity and your identity, and the fact we've communicated, and the net, the social network, the fact that I've come here and the people I've interacted with will be much more difficult to hide. So I think a lot of the, uh, so a lot of the enforcement, mm -hmm. and, the, and the, uh, 
and all the you know, chasing after criminals will be done by looking at them, looking for the networks rather than reading the messages. Sorry, can we just, I mean, they also, you know, I, I think uh, we're talking about quite a sophistication, whether we have encryption, whether can, people can look into the encryption and that sort of thing. But a lot of the censorship that's been happening in Africa over the last three or four years has actually been full internet shutdown. So that's about the most effective that's a, that's censorship that's you can get. And as I said, we need global responses to that. Those shutdowns happen with not a lot of multilateral pressure on the governments that are doing that. No reference to those countries being signatories to the UN Declaration of Human Rights and that. So I think it's these kinds of global governance things that find, I know, in this very complex you know, the conflict of norms that we're facing, find agreement on those basic rules of law, on the basic um, human rights, that we can at least get those kind of hard sh um, shutdowns and things you know, ad addressed. Thank you. Uh, Gurren, I think you'd like to have the last word. I, I always love to have the last word. I just want to go balancing part of the discussion. When you talked about the delegated internet and the networks of networks, remember that this design has been actually quite marvelous. We talk about a design that's 50 years old, and it's still the same design that has gone from zero users to three and a half billion users in a very short period of time. And I, I always urge people to think about, yes, there are many things to discuss and many things to solve, and then there are, you know, there's an evolutionary part of this, but that essential thing has provided internet to a large portion of the world. And do, and do that every day, every second, every minute. And that's something I think we really have to make sure that that's important for us. We guarantee that, because otherwise we won't have the same internet at all. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Goran. And I think at this point, since we're out of time, Ladies and gentlemen, will you help me thank the panel? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Um, we are now uh, changing to our next subject, which will be the internet governance related to the sustainable development goals. I'm very happy that this was put on the agenda by the IGF this year, and it, it, it will be prominently um, now seated. The people I will introduce to you in a second. And may I just start with the presenter? And if you were asking for cultural diversity, you will experience more in a second with this panel. And I would be kindly invite all the panelists and the moderator on stage. Um, I start to introduce to you Grace Gisaiga, She's the co-convener of the Kenya ICT Action Network and multi-stakeholder platform for people and institutions interested and involved in ICT policy and regulation. She has recently joined the Ushahidi board, fostering inclusion and supporting marginated voices. Grace advises several ICT-related organizations. And interestingly enough, since April this year, she's hosting the weekly TV show, Take on Tech, of the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation panelists, enabling the public to take to talk tech with experts. So I hope she's already there. There you are, yeah, definitely. And I hope I'm fine now with the real panelists uh, fitting to my paper. I think there hasn't been a change. I tried to prepare properly. Grace, and Grace will be coming with Yuta Kroll and Nenna Nwakanma, Ulin Joao, and John Denton, if I'm right. Great to have you here. You so, good. <laughs> so good. So <laughs> good. So may I introduce Yuta? Uh, may I introduce Yuta to you? She's a member of the multi-stakeholder advisory group at the AG, uh, uh, IGF, and since January 2018, she's the chairwoman of the Stiftung Digitale Chancen, which is very important in Germany and abroad. A German charity foundation working on fostering digital chances. Too good to have you here. So, and now, you're, ne you're Nenna. That's, of course, this, this, this is about my, okay. So, you, you are now Nenna. Yes. She's a really highly respected tech pioneer, a strategist and a leader in Africa. She advocates policy and systematic changes over more than 15 years of experience with different UN organizations in human rights, information society, gender equality, etc. And she has a big capacity to bridge the gap between the global and the local and the metro metropolitan and the rural. So we are too happy to have you here. Oh, yeah, you too. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going further with Hulin Zhuao. Since January 2015, he's the Secretary General of the International Telecommunication Union, 
ITU, if you don't know it yet, is the specialized UN agency for ICT services and technologies promotion, collaboration and standardization. So very happy to have you in your second term. Please take a seat. And uh, yeah, you know, it's a uh, pinky okay. We have We have the same. Can you please come back? Uh, Pinky, because yeah, come on. Can you please introduce yourself? Because the same, the same thing. It always happens with the females, but it's not in my duty. So please, Pinky. Thank you very much. My name is Pinky Kikana. I'm the deputy minister of the Department of Communications and Digital Technologies from South Africa, but I'm also the secretary general of the Pan African Women's Organization Power, a specialized agency of the African Union. Thank you. Thank you for having you very much. And finally, John Denton. He is a legal expert and advisor on global policy. Since May 2018, he's the Secretary General of the International Chamber of Commerce. And among other assignments, he's the member of the board of the UN Global Impact. Uh, he presi presides many other things, but I keep it now short. So enjoy your panel. I take the iPad and I take your questions on Slido, uh, also from the hubs and I come back in three quarters of an hour. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you so much for joining us for this panel. Uh, we realize it's late in the day, but we appreciate those of you who are here. Uh, since my panelists have already been uh, introduced, I'll not go back into that. And um, this panel is looking at SDGs and inclusion. Uh, for those of you who remember, SDGs were put into action in 2015, and they are a call for action to have an inclusive society that enjoys peace and, um, you know, um, thrives that uh, there is no poverty. So how do we achieve that? We can only achieve that if there is inclusion, an inclusion of everyone in this world. So that's what we are focusing on uh, in this panel. Um, um, Zhao had indicated that he might leave your flight. Uh, is You might leave at 4.45. Um, so some of the questions, I think I will fill them to you. And uh, at a point when you feel you can leave, uh, we will just allow you to do that. And uh, I will just start with you straight away, uh, Zhao. If you focus on SGDs, uh, what issues would you say are a priority for the ITU uh, list, especially on digital inclusion? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I uh, apologize for that. Uh, I have to uh, catch up with my flight tonight, so I might leave a little bit earlier. Uh, it's my pleasure to join this session. And we talk about uh, one world, one night, one vision. And we talked about one night. We are talking about the internet governance uh, uh, related matters. And that means for those who already connect online, we have issues of the security, privacy, communication, accessibility, affordability, all this. So that we come together to address this issue. So that is the one thing. But we also heard from our engineers, technicians, that the current net may not be that advanced. We have to increase the level of technology. You know, to, for example, we just heard from Tim Lee that in the future we'd like to have affordable uh, service, uh, internet, uh, you know, with uh, one gigahertz, uh, you know, our uh, two percent of income from any individual. So that is, uh, uh, is not the same as 10 years ago, you were not talk about the one gigahertz per, per month. So this technology advance will continue. And they, recently we just had our World Radio Communication Conference in Xiamashinka. I finished uh, that meeting Friday last week. And we're talking about 5G, we're talking about new technologies, so that we are working very hard with the private sector, with the companies to provide new technologies to upgrade the level of the internet. So that is the one thing. So we will not stay at the current service level. We have to move further and higher. But on the other hand, you talked about core population and one world, but one web. One web should connect everybody. Now today, half population not connected online yet. So this is a big challenge to us, and we have to 
extend our infrastructure to those people not connected to be connected. So that uh, challenge, you know, that uh, I, I will talk a little bit uh, later. And we also talked about uh, this kind of uh, uh, so-called uh, regulations of uh, technologies, uh, services, and of course people do not like to have uh, heavy technology regulations. And uh, we have to encourage, uh, you know, development, uh, competitions, and uh, good services. So that one, you know, people talked about uh, proper regulations, not uh, that kind of heavy regulations, not uh, talk about the so-called light, we have to have a proper. So that is another story about that. Now for me, I think that the ITU as a specialized agency of the United Nations, we definitely put uh, the new technologies uh, as our priority, but we also put the uh, connecting world, connecting people as our priorities. So to address this issue, we have to understand that for those who are not connected yet, why they're not connected? Because they are living in the poor area, remote area. They have no profit for the investors to go to that area. Therefore, to connect this not connected yet, we need to make more efforts, create more, you know, in favorable, favorable environment to attract investment. So that is, is a challenge to us. And here, you know, People ask me questions when I recently at our conferences, uh, for example, in Budapest, Hungary, we have our telecom event there. People ask me, Secretary General, you talked about not left anyone behind. Now we still have half population not connected yet. Can we have some idea from you when we have these people connected? Can we connect them all by 2030, which means from now, for the next 10 years, I thought, uh, realistically, it's not that kind of easy. But we also heard from, from previous speakers, that even from our leaders, we'd like to see this uh, be achieved earlier. So I do put, uh, for me, I put uh, four eyes as my, 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 my priorities. Four eyes means infrastructure. We have to extend our infrastructure to connect those who are not connected yet. We have to upgrade our infrastructure with new technologies. Because today you have uh, e-government. E-government will not be effective if you don't connect uh, people. So you have to connect them. So then you can have uh, e-government be effective. So we have to extend our infrastructure to them. We have to use uh, new technologies to upgrade the services. So infrastructure is uh, very important for us. And I too is interested by WISIS to take care of uh, infrastructure development. Then. We need an investment. And we know the gap. But how can we adjust the gap? We need an investment. You know, that the 2015 at the Davos, we talked a little bit about uh, strategy. We targeted uh, 2020 to connect next 1.5 billion people online. And the industry gave us some estimations. We need uh, 450 billion US dollars to connect the next 1.5 billion people online by 2020. So we asked the World Bank, can they help us? World Bank told us they don't have this money. They have their own priorities, they have own, own plan. When we come to the industry, industry told me, Secretary General, you are joking. 450 billion US dollars to connect the 1.5 billion people online by 2020, you are joking. We need a top. We need a triple of this. And one side we need more investment, one side we don't have money. So this is a big issue for us. So we have to create a good environment to encourage the investment. So investment is the second. And then we have to have innovation. If we do business as we did up to now, I think that we'll not be able to help us that much to connect these people, not connect the tech earlier. So we need innovative ideas to do the business. We need, of course, innovation for new technologies. And here, innovation not necessarily coming from big guys. Innovation could come from SMEs, small medium sized entrepreneurs. And nobody can have any success to any market if you don't have uh, contributions, coordination with uh, SMEs, local SMEs. And SMEs know technology, they know the market, they know how can they help us to connect uh, local community with new technologies. So we have to work with them. So innovation also comes from them. And then last I is uh, inclusiveness. 
Again, it's my favorite uh, language. I have to leave, not leave anybody behind. Now I'm so more and more challenged. When we can have everybody connected online. So this is uh, something that, uh, again, I put these four eyes on the agenda, and we'd like to work together with everybody concerned to go with this kind of uh, strategy and to make sure that uh, you know, we will extend the benefit of the internet to everybody earlier rather than later. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Um, as our, uh, our, our Secretary General, I allowed you to speak for longer because I know you'll be leaving at some point. But you raised some uh, very important uh, points. I like the idea of the four eyes. And I think they directly, uh, one of the issues that has been highlighted is on innovation. And uh, I think I'll come to you, John, uh, you know, from a business perspective or from what we call, uh, you know, the industry. There's a challenge right there uh, when the Secretary General says uh, he was told he's joking uh, because that is, uh, you know, because in terms of the investments that are required. But uh, in terms of uh, connectivity and infrastructure, how would you rate the performance of businesses? Well, thanks very much. It's great to be here. And um, uh, it's an honor to be on such a distinguished panel. So, uh, but allow me to make a, maybe a, a different um, uh, turn to the question you ask. I mean, if you listen to uh, Secretary General Guterres, you look and listen to the Chancellor earlier, and you read the stuff. I mean, it's great to see so many people engaged uh, with the internet and to be digitally enabled, but we still have the reality that half the world is not. Now, uh, it's not so much rating business, it's just the reality that we actually have a policy failure here. Uh, clearly, governments have not been able to act at the level and the speed and with the frameworks required. And I think business as usual won't get us where we want to get to, to deliver on the eye of inclusivity. We actually have to do what we call business as unusual. We actually have to involve the business community a lot more in helping to create an environment for this massive infrastructure investment to occur. But we've also got to be really honest. Um, there are actual disincentives for investment to support the sustainable development goals. I mean, I like to talk about what I discovered. I mean, I've only been in this role for a little over a year, and I'm not really, uh, I'm not a diplomat, I'm not a politician, I'm a business person fundamentally. But what I discovered was that there is misalignment between the intent and the way in which the financial markets operate. And actually, if you look at it, um, there's uh, the Addis Ababa Declaration, which came out, it was pretty explicit about how you finance and support the SDGs. You need to invest in infrastructure, you need to create the environment for investment in developing countries, and you actually need to invest for the long term. But if you look at the way the financial market operates, how does the Financial Stability Board rate all those approaches? High risk, high risk, high risk. Okay, so the reality is to actually get access to the capital required is extremely expensive. So there's a misalignment. So one of my jobs is not to rate the private sector, it's to enable the private sector. And the whole purpose of the ICC is to enable the private sector, enable business worldwide to secure peace, prosperity, and opportunity for all. We genuinely believe in it. Uh, I'm the voice, I may, I'm relatively small, but I'm the voice of 45 million businesses from the North and the South, from Africa to America, from Syria to Israel. We actually represent all those voices. My job is to enable them and to create settings that enable them to support the SDGs, because we genuinely support the SDGs, because we see it as the citizen's bargain for the 21st century. We support action on climate. We've mobilised 10 million businesses globally at local level for action on climate. So my aim is to actually align the policy settings at a peak level and then mass mobilise, and to use innovation to support the mass mobilisation. And we can talk about that later, but we don't talk, we act. And that's an important element. And also, sometimes we act and we have to fix things later. So I think it was also said by uh, Secretary General Guterres on the way through as well. Uh, great. Um, I think, um, you know, there's the issue of inclusion, again, as one, as another of the four, uh, four eyes. And I come to you, uh, Pinky, as a deputy minister and as a representative of governments, 
and um, I assume that you will be speaking for many of the African governments when you respond, because I know when you go to ITU, you speak with one voice. When you go to these international negotiations, you speak with one voice. And uh, maybe you should tell us what, what, what should African governments do to bring all Africans into SDGs? Um, you know, what should these interventions look like, practical interventions? Look, thank you very much. One of the things that um, we have achieved as the continent is to align the SDGs or the SDGs are aligned to Agenda 2063, which is the blueprint of the developmental agenda for Africa. Now, not only did we do that, but various member states also ensured that the National Development Plan, in one way or the other, aligned their programs towards the SDG and Agenda 2063. So that's the one point that governments have done across the continent. But one of the things that also comes very, very glaring is that, well, even before I go to that, if you look at the SDGs, um, most of the things that we have incorporated or aligned into Agenda 2063 also speaks to some of the commitment that John spoke to. And I think, John, while I agree with you that uh, the policy and the regulatory framework might be one of the impeding um, uh, issue for business to invest in the, in the continent or in various governments, what we also need to do is to say, in as much as the UN has agreed with uh, developed countries to say, at least 0.7% oh, yes. wow. of your uh, gross national income should, should be there to assist developing countries. How much of that has been done? And, and that's one of the things that uh, developed countries should also look at. But it also requires us as the developing countries to measure and to monitor the implementation of some of those things. Because the reality is that you will not be happy that we, we are left behind as developed, developing countries, and, and, and that will also not fulfill the big agenda of, of SDGs, including the developmental aspects that we all want to achieve. So you, between me and you, you leave developing countries at your own peril. Oh, but I'm completely engaged with developing countries. But I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, yeah. once we're not uh, committing and making Absolutely. sure that the 0.7% 100%. is achieved. 100%. Okay, okay, good people. Um, uh, address uh, your questions through the chair. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. I think John will give you an opportunity to respond to that. Um, so that everybody can hear what, uh, I think you've been challenged. It would be good to hear what the businesses uh, have to say about that particular response. Uh, Yuta, we come to you. What would you say, um, you know, you work with women, you ensure, you know, that you want women to be brought on board, to be included. So what, what would you say are the gaps or barriers uh, to digital inclusion? say, in 2019? Um, if you allow, I would like to skip my notes that I have prepared before and answer to the 4i agenda, because uh, from my perspective, I would add a fifth issue, although it's not starting with an I, but with an E, and that is education. And, and that's a lesson that we've learned over the last 20 years. When we started our work, um, we, we thought that bridging the digital divide would be a question of access. And of course, now in the Northern Hemisphere, many people have access. We've heard about the 80% to the 20% ratio compared to, to the less developed countries. But uh, I do think that we can only overcome the gaps and barriers 
if access and education go hand in hand. You, you can't benefit from the access you have if you don't have the education, if you don't have the competencies uh, to make useful, uh, uh, to make useful use of, of the, the uh, internet and the application that serve you for your daily life. So that's my suggestion that you add the E uh, as well. Um, and that, that gives me the opportunity to refer to um, another organization that I'm representing here on the panel, not only the Digital Opportunities Foundation from Germany, but uh, the European Umbrella Organization uh, for Public Internet Access Points. The, the interesting thing is that when the organization was founded in 2008, they called themselves Telecenters Europe. And you all might know Telecenters or Telehuts or uh, also called Internet Cafes. These were places where people could have access to the Internet when they did not have that on their own. Now that many people have their smartphone or their feature phone in, on the African continent uh, in their pocket, uh, these places have become another important relevance, and that is that they also provide access to education, and they have a scheme of competences that are necessary to make useful access. So, and uh, I can announce that the manifesto to enhance digital competences will just be launched during this Internet Governance Forum. And I will go a bit more in detail if you allow later on in the debate. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, good people, uh, audiences, we are not trending on Twitter. Could we please tweet? Angela Merkel is still at number one, but uh, it was our function, so can we please tweet and uh, make sure that IGF 2019 uh, is, is trending. Uh, now, Nena, I need you to charge the audience so that they tweet and, um, and, uh, and um, say nice things about this. Now, um, you, you know, the work that you do is mainly to see that there's digital inclusion. Uh, of everybody, that everybody is brought on board. Uh, so you look at digital inclusion as an inequality issue. How are women, youth, and other marginalized groups, especially the southern countries, uh, affected and being brought on board? Good evening, people. My name is Nenna and I come from the internet. And Madam Chair, the reason IGF is not trending is because there are some Berliners who are not happy and they are manifesting. There's a strike in town and that strike is number one. You could do all your internet all you want, but as long as people are not happy, that is what is going to trend. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Now let's come to your question. Um, earlier on, uh, the chancellor said that the greatest value of the internet is freedom. And I tweeted that and I noted it down. However, it is not the internet in itself, it is actually the connectivity that the internet gives us, that gives us freedom. So I would like to rephrase that in saying that the greatest value is meaningful connectivity. And the greatest value of meaningful connectivity is freedom. Now what is meaningful connectivity? I've heard it lots and lots, 50% of the world global population is online, but that is actually not the fact. Because um, I should introduce someone here, this is my phone, it's a Huawei P20 Pro. We go together leg to leg. You see me, you see my phone. Now, when we talk about meaningful connectivity, it means that I have enough data at an affordable rate. Tim Berners-Lee spoke about one for two. That is one gigabyte of data being available to me for not more than 2% of the mean salary in the country. Meaningful connectivity also means that I have adequate speed because there is no point having data and not being able to do anything with it. Meaningful connectivity means that I have frequent uninterrupted internet access. Hello? Hello, Africa? 
Hello, people who shut down the internet because there's going to be election. Hello, people who cut down the internet because people are manifesting. Hello to people who think that being on social media is a crime. Hello, I need uninterrupted internet access for meaningful connectivity. And finally, I need a device that is capable of doing things. People are talking about taking videos and uploading them. If you are using feature phones, you can't do a lot of things today. My phone, I have about 150 applications on it, and I can do a lot of things. So I'm one of those who have meaningful access. Once again, meaningful access, the greatest value of meaningful access is freedom. Freedom from digital inexistence. Freedom of digital colonialism, where people who are marginalized are meant to have connectivity for, with their data in exchange. You're basically selling your digital souls just to get connected. We need that kind of freedom. Freedom from financial exclusion, so that I can send and receive money. Freedom from bad governance, so I can raise a voice. Freedom from lack of voice, so I can speak out and be heard. Freedom from hunger and poverty. These are the things that we have in the SDGs. Freedom from illegal immigration, if I may add that. So meaningful connectivity is freedom from social, economic, and digital exclusion. And I think that attacking these points that give connectivity its meaning will be helpful as it's launched yesterday in the contract for the web, the nine principles of the contract for the web, each has action points that I believe that once we take them on and really begin to work on them, we will have not just connectivity for the other 50%, but meaningful connectivity that will give us freedom. Um. Meaningful um, internet is one that offers freedom. And as you spoke, I, you know, you, you, I thought of Martin Luther King. I thought of uh, Sarafina in South Africa. Uh, and I thought, yeah, you actually need a lot of freedom to do all those things. Uh, and that's why internet is actually uh, unique in its governance because it can't be governed by just one side of, the, of society. Uh, Zao, we come to you uh, because I think um, some of the issues that have been raised uh, either require uh, some intervention from your end. And um, I'm going to ask you, what do you think is the role of regulation? And what are measures being taken by the ITU to ensure that all policy processes are inclusive, because the ITU has been criticized for that, especially for excluding civil society. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't know whether we are criticized by excluding civil society, <laughs> because it's ITU who actually suggests the United Nations to organize the WISIS, World Summit Information Society in 1998, when we realized that uh, we cannot leave the future of technology of communications in the hand of uh, telecom engineers and uh, experts only. So we have to engage uh, in, uh, everybody in, to come together to address the technology in development. So that is the reason we invited the United Nations to organize uh, WISIS. And we organized you know, the partnership of the UN uh, two phases of WISIS, one is uh, in December 2003 and the uh, second one was uh, November 2005. And uh, the result of this WISIS process, we have IGF. So that uh, we uh, actually, it's uh, among UN systems, I think that we are very proud to be earlier ones to ask uh, uh, our platform open to the civil society, the NGOs. So that is we are very proud of. Uh, but anyhow, when you talk about regulation, I, 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 Madam, I would uh, very much like to highlight that uh, if you look at the last two decades, the world suffered a lot about the financial crisis and some other crises. But still, the telecom business is still developed. 
And they partly, in my opinion, is because of the hard work of our regulators. They try to encourage competition and fair competition and then to have a good development of the, of the market so that uh, thanks to their you know, good job, you know, we have this uh, uh, development of uh, telecommunications uh, achieved uh, uh, the result as today we can see. And of course, uh, you know, we internally we have a, a platform we call the Global Symposium of uh, Regulators. And they often come together to address the issue of uh, challenges from market. We talked about the heavy regulation or the light regulation or no regulation and all these kind of things. But we found that uh, no regulation may not be the good things, but then heavy regulation may not be good either. So that we like to talk about the proper regulations. And today, the situation is different now. It's not the regulation for telecom business, telecom services. The regulators face new challenges to talk about uh, those ICT services for the other ecosystem, like financial systems, like education systems, like uh, you know, health uh, uh, you know, systems, that we, we, we very rapidly get into those areas. We are very uh, much engaged with uh, modernization of this system, and then we use ICT, and then it's uh, new challenges. And here I am very pleased to, to also note that our government, our authorities, also put this highly on their agenda. When I visited some of Africa countries, I, I heard from the chairman of the parliament that said that to leave this to the telecom authority alone is not sufficient. The government has to work as this, because the parliament received a request from a telecom authority, from a health authority, from the education authorities for different, uh, you know, uh, recommendations or laws to be approved, but all of this now always link with ICTs, so that uh, government want to see if we can have a general policy. Now, we heard uh, from the other side, people talked about uh, regulation for telecom and then talked about uh, OTTs, you know, that the uh, conflict between OTT and uh, telecom, so there are a lot of issues. So uh, IT is working very hard with our regulatory bodies encourage them to have open and uh, sometimes uh, less light regulations. And then also to look at the new areas where we can introduce ICT to support education, finance, and government, all these kind of uh, uh, challenges. So that uh, we, we are open to all the opinions. And uh, you know, if there's any proposal from uh, anyone who would like to suggest us to to, to, to follow and to take care, you know, we we, we, we like to to work with them. Now, since I have to leave because my my colleague already asked me to go to the airport now, right. I would just like to answer uh, invitation from my colleague that uh, we have to add education. Education is absolutely important. I like to continue uh, the short story I just mentioned to you when we talked about not leave anybody behind. People ask me when you can collect them. Then I said, you know, 2030 may not be able to cover everybody. But then my colleagues, the ministers, suggest if you cannot reach the goal to connect everybody by 2030, can we do something to reach a goal by 2030 to have a use young people to reach, uh, you know, some kind of a digital literacy? And this, we are talking about one billion young people. So this, uh, I think that that's something definitely we have to engage capacity building and the education all this, so that uh, you know we are looking at this issue and we will be very pleased to work with uh, with you and uh, with everybody to see how, how can we we uh, you know address this challenge. Of course, at the UN level, we work with UNESCO, we work uh, with. Uh, UNICEF, we work with, uh, you heard of that presentation from Secretary General, we, we, we have a common project, and we work with uh, others, and we, we particularly address those issues of capacity building, and the capacity building is, uh, is uh, you know, good things for everybody. So we have, but uh, we have gap here, so we will do our best. So, uh, Madam, if you allow me, I have to leave now. I wish you a successful uh, in the session, and uh, uh, look for another opportunity to, to talk to you afterwards. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, uh, and we wish you a safe journey.
Okay, uh, John will come back to you. And uh, because, uh, because of time and we want to give audiences time to ask questions. Um, we would have some, Grace. If you want, shall we bring them on the table? Or no, no not yet. Uh, John, no, no. yeah. Okay. After John and okay. then uh, we'll bring the questions. Uh, because we want the session to be interactive Please. also. Uh, but I think this one is important for John. I think one of the things that you need to do is to respond to what Pinky was asking you. And uh, then I would also want you to tell us uh, what priority measures need to be taken by businesses so that we have businesses here, they hear what we need to increase participation of all in the digital economy. Oh, look, thanks very much. Um, with, with Pinky's provocation, um, uh, I actually, I'm an Australian, I, I, a few years ago I did a review of the Australian Development Assistance Budget when Australia was on track hit 0.7 GNI and uh, my job was to come up as a business person with a strategy to support that. Uh, two things I learned along the way. One is it's absolutely critical for development to actually have a healthy and functioning private sector and uh, one of our aims was to direct the Australian Development Assistance Budget to support that. The second is that development aid agencies have a complete inability to communicate effectively with the private sector. So the very thing we need to do is actually more complex because we're talking different languages. So until we can get alignment, that's one of the things that we do at the International Chamber of Commerce is try to create a collaborative relationship and a collaborative environment between development assistance agencies and the private sector so that we can solve real problems and actually support development. Uh, we won't get there and what we're working on is a scalable solution to that as well because that's just what we do. Now the next question you ask, by the way, Pinky did ask me if I would give her $1.7 trillion. Well, <laughs> oh, deal done, Pinky, deal done. Um, the next issue about what should the private sector do, well, there's a couple of things. There's often a, a, a challenge in these conversations, particularly with politicians, uh, international, international governmental officials, etc. sometimes with journalists as well, that they actually don't understand the complexity of the private sector. The private sector is not lots and lots and lots of big companies. When you actually look at the private sector, the dominant element of the private sector, and we're talking about 95% are SME, small medium enterprises and micro enterprises. I come out of the Indo-Pacific area and it's actually around, I know it's exactly around those sort of numbers because I worked on this for a long time. So our job is actually to recognize a couple of things. So most private sector entities don't make a lot of money. They actually have very skinny margins. If we want to help the private sector support the creation of opportunity for all, which is really the, the enabling power that we would say the ICC does, we actually have to provide it tools, capability, access, improvement. We've got to recognise the challenges that SMEs have, micro SMEs have. Generally it's access to finance, you know, the other element is too much regulation, too much complexity, etc. What we have to do is identify real problems. So a classic that we're working on at the moment, um, we created a digital hub in Singapore, the sole purpose of which is to enable opportunity for businesses. We identified emerging threat in sustainable development goals, which is the, with the increased focus on sustainability. Um, it's becoming more and more important if you want to participate in a global supply chain that you can show that the goods you produce were actually produced sustainably. If you're a, an Indonesian working near palm forest, you know, palm oil forest, you actually need to show how that product was developed. Otherwise, you can't access procurement chains. You can't access value chains. And if you can't do that, the value of your business will go down, your margins will be killed, and you'll go out of business and you'll lose the opportunity to employ people. So what do we do? We've actually created a blockchain solution, because frankly, blockchain's interesting, but what's the real impact of it? Where can you get, and it's really around traceability. So we created a blockchain um, solution called ICC Clarify, and the whole intent there is to democratize access to blockchain to support SMEs and micro SMEs to continue to participate in the sustainably developed world, which is really important. And we do that, and we're giving it away for free. Because ultimately, if we can't help businesses get access to digital, new digital tools which can support them in the future, well, what's the point of this? 
What's the point of all this? So they're the sort of things that I think need to be focused on on a continual basis. We can, if you want, I'm happy to give my two cents worth on governance later on as well. But let's also not put impediments in the way of the internet continuing to prosper. The reality that we heard before from the Secretary General was the concern about the potential barriers, et cetera, which is the decoupling. We haven't really talked about it here. But there's other ones as well. We've got governments right now talking at the WTO about putting tariffs and taxes on the internet that will stop the access to digital downloads. It's unbelievable, and I can't accept that in this conference we have not been talking about that. The maintenance of the moratorium on tariffs against tariffs on digital downloads is critical to the capacity for innovation in developing countries. Don't tax, don't put tariffs, don't break the internet. Um, I think we'll go to the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, the first question we wanted to drop is very much related to the question how to encourage uh, entrepreneurs to really work in the field. You have been saying a lot to that. I go for another question. What do the panelists consider the greatest challenges to accomplish digital literacy regardless of gender or age? Uh, do you want to take that here? Yeah. And then also. Okay, so so maybe I, I start. I do think that uh, digital literacy is somehow an abstract uh, term. It doesn't. Uh, we need to explain what competences are really necessary, and we don't need. We shouldn't assume that we all start from common ground. Of course, it's different how you obtain digital literacy and what you need in regard of digital competencies. It depends on your age, it depends on your gender, it depends, but also it depends on where you had access to places where you can obtain these competences. And there we have the huge differences. We, we see that lots of girls around the world don't have the same opportunities like boys have to, to go to school to obtain these at uh, this necessary literacies and education. So there are the differences, and we need to overcome these gender differences, but we also need to bear in mind that it's not all that start from common ground. It's different around the world. But nonetheless, we need a common framework to, to validate these competencies. So it's not like you just can say, oh, okay, I've taken a course and that now I'm digital literate. It depends on what you will use these competences for. And so I do think that we need a validation framework that need, works across the work, and we need op equal opportunities for access to education. Thank you. I wanted to come back to the framework, the policy framework we have at the World Wide Web Foundation. It's five words, R-E-A-C-T, REACT. So the R is for rights, rights-based. And I want to look straight into the eyes of every person here and say connectivity is not a luxury. Uh, Madam Deputy Minister, it is a right. Meaningful connectivity is a right. You don't, it's not a favor you are doing to me when you're allowing me to get connected. So that's right. Education is very important, skills, because I don't want to pay uh, $20 for a gig and then not get the return back. Why would someone who earns $100 a month spend $20 on one gigabyte of data without being able to explain how that brings himself and his family out of poverty? So we need uh, uh, access, we need rights, education, access. We, we talked about one, one for two. Content is another thing. Um, if someone is coming online, what, is, what are they finding online? In which language? What SDGs are being addressed with the content that is online? Mm -hmm. Did you get my question? Mm -hmm. if I, how does going online reduce poverty in my house? People don't care about big language. They don't care about IGF. They don't care about hashtags and Slido. They care about bread and butter, education and health. And finally, targets. I live in West Africa, and what happens is that when we measure, connect, when we measure connectivity, 
You live in Nairobi. I know you. We know each other. You know how we measure these things. We bring in these scientists who come and measure things at the major city and go home. And then the data you have for the major city is 50, 80, 90 percent. And then you, that is what the minister comes to announce. We have 90 percent mobile rate penetration. You are lying. You need to get out of the city. You need to go into the village. How can you have meaningful connectivity without electricity? How can you have meaningful connectivity without freedom of speech? So the framework is that first of all, it's a right. We need people to be educated. Education is mandatory even for the government. I'll take that again. Digital education is mandatory even for government, hello, mm -hmm. and access, affordable access, content that is meaningful and can bring us out of poverty and targets. We need to fix the target 100% across the country. That's our framework, React. Thanks, Nena. Um, I, I like when you say the minister comes and announces this is what meaning most ICT ministers are male. So we are very happy to have Pinky here. And this next question, uh, I'm actually directing it to you, Pinky. Uh, there's somebody who's asked, what about those communities that find digital inclusion as not something worthwhile? Does the state force or assist them to become represented in the digital sphere? Look. One of the things that we have realized, especially in South Africa, is that we, you cannot even talk digital literacy when people are not connected. And, and, and one of the things that we are even saying, and, and here I'll, I'll limit our experience to the South African situation, to say, look, when the democratic order came into being in South Africa, Part of the things that we saw as basic services was provision of water and electricity. But today, seated here, internet becomes a utility that you cannot avoid as government. So for us to be able to do that, infrastructure becomes one of the things that become primary. So. In as much as we're able to cover close to 95% of our communities with electricity, now we have to look at how we're able to roll out broadband infrastructure for our people not to be left behind. So it's some of the things that we, we really need to look at because once you do that, you are trying to include and make sure that nobody's left behind, but you are also wanting them to improve and use the resource that is available around them, use technology to advance their developmental agenda. And Africa, being Africa and South Africa in particular, land is in abundance. And once you bring technology into the agricultural space, you're bringing better life to our people. So whatever technology that you bring to our people, it must speak to their day-to-day -day lives. It must add value to what they are doing. So use that to take them to another uh, developmental level. And, and once you do that, our people will start to appreciate. Uh, John, uh, you won't escape. There's one question here. What are catalysts and drivers of gender inclusive social tech entrepreneurship. <laughs> Maybe you can say something. I don't know if I even understand what that is. Uh, <laughs> gender inclusive social tech. Boom. Maybe you and, and what? <laughs> And entrepreneurship. Oh, okay. Well, I mean, maybe I can do all, put it in this context. I'm actually in the process of um, creating uh, ICC centres for entrepreneurship, and we're commencing our first one. Uh, it's a pan-Arab uh, centre for entrepreneurship, and it'll be based in Beirut. And in fact, I was um, hoping to be in Beirut um, uh, 
on the 20th and 21st, but unfortunately because of the challenges there at the moment, as a consequence in many respects of many of the issues we need to be grappling with, I was unable to travel there. Um, what we're looking at there is actually using uh, connectivity and uh, internet and tech and rather than building a bricks and mortar centre for entrepreneurship, we're actually building a virtual centre for entrepreneurship, ICC. And what we're doing is that we're identifying that um, uh, the target group there is between the age of about 18 to 28, most of whom have access to mobile phones with applications. Uh, what we're trying to do is encourage more uh, accessibility for women in the pan-Arab world as well, and we're studying this in Beirut. And the reason we're doing it this way is that we can have the capacity for scale. And when we talk about entrepreneurship, can I say, we are not interested whatsoever in discovering unicorns. What we're actually doing is identifying a problem where at that age group in a particular challenging world, challenging environment, people cannot and they will not get jobs because multinationals are not employing, uh, businesses are actually struggling, and in fact, in many respects, the internet is destroying jobs as well. So we have to find a way of helping people create a living. That's what we talk about with entrepreneurship, and by doing that, by actually understanding how to do that for themselves. So we see that as entrepreneurship and encouraging engagement with the private sector, and that is not limited to men. That is actually, we're using this virtual tool to give mass access. We'll then launch as well in uh, Istanbul for Europe Asia, and at the moment we're trying to work out where will be the best position for us in Africa. Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone, Africa. This has been my passion for the past 15 years, women in tech, trust me. <laughs> Three years ago I got a couple thousand dollars gifted to me by Shuttleworth Foundation. They said, Nena, we love what you're doing, go do it. So I did a trip across five countries of West Africa, meeting women in tech and asking, what is wrong with us? The first thing is financial access to finance and markets. You can, I mean, hey, are there any ladies in the room? <laughs> okay, so you have your business, you worked on this presentation, you know your stuff, you walk up there, you finish it, you hit it, and then when someone says, your lipstick is so nice. <laughs> I mean, I'm talking business and you're looking at my body. I want the contract signed. So access <laughs> to finance and market is really very important. There is mentorship that is needed for women. We run something called Africa, uh, Women and Girls Tech Summit in Africa, and she's one of the mentors. You see the girls we have there. We want to talk to them, lead them. Money is not the biggest uh, challenge for women in women entrepreneurs is actually champions who will lead them across, who will share experiences and get those women to move forward. The other thing is we've learned, um, I'm an open source, open tech, open government person, women only spaces are really very important, whether it's coding, yeah, or women feel comfortable when they're in women only places, it helps us thrive. And the policies of course, the estate policies that encourage women. And to all the women, knowing your stuff is not enough. Dressing well is not enough. Unfortunately, it's still a man's world. And you need to hype up your business acumen. You need to talk shit sometimes. You need to look people in the eye and say, I know this better than you do. And if sometimes you need to be offensive. So we need to know business. Men are ruthless when it comes to business. Women need to be ruthless when it comes to business and money. Do your stuff, get your money. So when I ran the five country thing, I was asking the women, is it okay for you to be rich? They're like, yeah, I want to help. I want to, nonsense. What's wrong with you buying your own private jet? Make the money, bring it, we'll help you spend it among the girls. Thank you. I think. <laughs> I think I, I fully agree with Nina, and I'm saying <laughs> we know, give a woman an opportunity. Women are change makers, and women are sharers. Mm -hmm. And any business that is run by women, it's not easy for that business to collapse. So I agree fully with you, my dear sister, and I think the, the important thing and the challenge is that in most businesses, especially in the ICT sector, uh, John, uh, not many women own these businesses alone. It, it's a woman and a co-founder, it's a male, and it's a major, he's a major shareholder. 
We want to see transformation, real transformation in this sector and have financial services. I know I'm talking to you from the business point of view, but we want real empowerment for women-owned businesses, for them to run in the ICT sector. Thank you. Uh, John, unfortunately, you are the only... Uh, is an endangered panel. species today. But, yeah, but don't worry, we are empowering you, you know. <laughs> today you are the empowered man. Um, so we have mm. six minutes to go, and yet there were some two questions here. I don't know how we proceed, because it seems like John wants to speak. Yeah. No, it's okay. It's, it's, no. Okay. It's, it's okay, but I don't disagree with you about ICT, but don't forget that enabling the digital platform has actually helped a lot of women entrepreneurs to access e-commerce and actually build businesses. And again, why would you put barriers in the way of e-commerce? Why would you do that? Why would you stop access to innovation to women in business? You've got to actually work on it. So, I mean, we, we see this as a fundamental. We've, we've declared, for example, the ICC has declared that we will work on ensuring access to the digital economy because we know it's good. It will help reduce global inequality. It will actually help in terms of leading for the long term. It'll help deliver the sustainable development goals and actually create an environment where we can do something about Paris, which we haven't really talked about at all yeah. today. So we're there. We're there. And I can tell you one thing, the women of the ICC, and one of them will be speaking on the next panel, Maria Fernanda from Mexico, uh, they're not quiet. They've got strong voices as well. Oh, well done. All right. Um, I think any of the panelists can take this. It has to do with the future of work. And uh, how do we equip the workforce of the 21st century with the skills to take advantage of the new employment opportunities that come with digital transformation? Uh, I don't know who wants to speak into that. Yuta? Uh, that gives me the opportunity to once again refer to the manifesto because this is all about uh, the digital competences you need for the workforce. Um, I also want to pick up on, I think what Pinky said, give women an opportunity and they will use it. And of course digitization offers so many opportunities, especially for women that we have not yet unearthed. So we, we need to support that, we need to open up that opportunities to make women to make use of it. That is most important. And a final point, I think it was already referred to safety and trust as the two pillars, uh, that stable pillars that enable us to make use of such opportunities. And I, I do think that we can't achieve digital inclusion when we neglect that we need safety and we need trust also again. Because what would it be worth to bring the next billion to have access to the internet if they don't trust in the internet and if they don't feel safe when using the internet. So I do think these are also pillars that count in the workforce. It's about private and about workforce use. So let's not neglect these two stable pillars for, for digital inclusion. Sorry, I lost the fact. Okay, and then I'll request One you minute. to keep your interventions very short. In football, they call it now we are in the injury time. Eh? Yeah. I work from home. And I think the future of work is me. Our offices are in London, in Jakarta, and in DC. And my, my teammates are here. They are, they are scattered all over. And I really want to say that we need to understudy um, remote work. I don't like winter. I like eating starch and vegetables. West Africa is the right place for me. I have no intention to migrate. I'm happy where I am. I have good, meaningful internet connectivity, and that allows me to be productive. So whether we are women or marginalized population, I think that greater access, work from home, respect with the people that we work with, it's a good way. Of course, we didn't talk about artificial intelligence and, and robotics, but I think that is also the future of work, whichever way connectivity is at the center of it. My name is Nenna, and I want to thank you very okay. much. Just, just one last comment. Uh, I think, um, Pinky, I would like you to respond to this because we can't be talking of inclusion 
and uh, not deal with this question. So as you respond, please also respond to this. How can children's rights for protection, provision, and participation be equally addressed and guaranteed in the transforming digital uh, environments? We have one minute, 30 seconds. I know you want to. <laughs> Just two comments. Ne? One is on the future of work. And one of the things that I would want to urge all of us to look at is that currently as we speak, and I'll give the South African situation, lots of jobs are shared. What is it that we do currently to, do, to save the jobs that are there, whether in the financial services and other things? So skilling and skill... Uh, Reskilling and unlearning, it's one of the things that we should focus on. Because in as much as we want to deal with the future, currently there are realities that confront us. That's one. But two, if you look at the South African constitution, and people like saying it is the most progressive constitution, chapter two of that constitution speaks about the Bill of Rights. And this constitution was enacted in 1996. Now, in that time, internet penetration was not the way it is. So if you look at how the, the protection of children and other things were incorporated, today we need to talk about digital protection of little ones because online protection for children it's of paramount importance. So it's some of those things that we now have to look into going forward. Please. Okay. <laughs> okay, just a final word on children's rights because I do see the need for protection of children, but first and foremost, I would put the right to freedom of expression, the right to access to information, all laid down in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, ratified by 196 states around the world. So they all are legally bound to commit to these rights and to adhere to these rights. Also, there is a right to education, and that means today digital literacy education. So we need a balanced approach between the right to protection and those rights of freedom to expression, freedom to information. Thank you. Okay, so thank you, John Denton. Thank you, uh, Pinky Kekana, Deputy Minister. We hope that next time you'll not be deputy, you'll be the substantive uh, minister. Uh, thank you, Yuta, and thanks, Nana, for never disappointing. Um, so please uh, help me applaud this panel. I think they've been a very interesting a group and we want to thank to thank them so thank you so much thank you very much grace i can thank you also perfectly in time thank you all very much thank you very much take, to taking into account the questions from the audience too thank you very very much and for your strength on the panel um, there was one question that leads us directly, that was uh, digitally pronounced. How can SMEs be supported to connect the unconnected? Which leads directly to the next high-level panel, Internet Governance and SMEs. And it has been mentioned a lot, also by John. So I now hand over the microphone to Dr. Friederike Grote. She is a partner at Grote Medienberatung, which is an agency for strategies in politics and communication. And the agency focuses on the interface of politics, media, digital economy and science. And very interestingly enough, it just recently worked on a project uh, at the heart of our next session, which is in cooperation with the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. It explored the opportunities of internet governance for SMEs. So she initially started out as, I do my best, Friederike. Uh, uh, no, to, to, she started out as a journalist, so I think she's really, her whole DNA consists of curiosity, and we learn a lot from her now. You, you, you get our panelists to work. Okay, enjoy. <laughs> So let me see, this, this works already, and we want to give um, the panel guests before us enough time to get their photos and get the message out 
uh, visually too. Um, just, just sit wherever you like, no order. Just like put here maybe? Okay, that's wonderful. Um, so that's great. Um, good afternoon, everybody here and out there at the remote hubs. Um, I think we are all excited uh, to sit here, be here, and uh, be able to continue, actually, with many of the issues we've just heard. Um, I'm uh, very delighted that I have a lot of entrepreneurial spirit here around me, um, because each of uh, the guests of this high-level panel has already been a founder, has already had some startup experience um, themselves. So um, we have now the opportunity not only to talk about entrepreneurs, but also with entrepreneurs, which is very nice. Um, my guests are Sue Kahumbu Stefanu. <laughs> She's coming from um, uh, organic farming, actually, and has founded, um, among other firms, Green Dreams Tech. Green Dreams Tech um, has produced a famous um, application, you can say, or a service or a platform. We will hear more about this later. It, it's called iCow, and it helps farmers to get information, to get knowledge, to get access to experts, and to get advice on how to better farm. ICAO has been awarded with several prizes and was also mentioned uh, by Forbes just lately as an outstanding application in Africa. Um, Heike Hölzner. Heike Hölzner is um, a professor of entrepreneurship at HTW. I shorten that, I abbreviate that, I hope that's okay. It's the University of Applied Science here in Berlin. She's worked and still working also as a coach for startup uh, um, accelerators for governmental programs. She's an expert in digital transformation in various areas, so not confined to only one industry. And she was just awarded being one of top 40 under 40 in science and society by the renowned business magazine Capital. Um, to my left is Pavel Kazakov. He's launched indeed several startups and is now the CEO of one of his latest startups. It's called Gaiwan. Uh, it's a tea manufacturer. And even though it's tea and a very analog and hands on thing, it's sold only online but uh, across, mainly online, uh, but across Europe and other countries in the world. Um, Pavel is a trained engineer, and uh, that helps him a lot, I guess, or helped to bring us other interests about, which is Magento, working with Magento, an open source tool for um, building e-commerce solutions for building online shops, and I'm sure we will hear about that later, too. He's also active in, the, uh, in a business organization named Young Entrepreneurs here in Germany. And Maria Fernanda Gata. Um, she is also an entrepreneur. She has an experience not uh, in e-commerce, but really in manufacturing, distributing uh, building um, supplies and building uh, uh, tools. She is president and CEO of Orestia in Mexico City, a firm that's uh, building innovative, innovative solutions for plumbing, mm -hmm. and also internationally active in all the Americas and part of Asia, as I, as I learned. Uh, Maria Fernanda is also very interested in uh, bringing the business uh, environment about in general, in national and international levels, and so that I don't get it wrong, I will read this. She is currently a member of the executive board of the International Chamber of Commerce, it's called ICC, we've heard that a lot <laughs> in the past half, uh, half an hour, and she's president of ICC Mexico and also the regional coordinator for the Americas. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much for agreeing um, to discuss. We're starting out um, almost uh, as part of the mission we, we were given earlier this afternoon when it was uh, said, I think it was the Chancellor who said, um, the multi 
lateral discussion about internet, about the internet and how it works is also uh, an issue for businesses. We have to bring all together. It's not only a political issue, only not only civil society, but also businesses. So we will continue really this, um, this line. Our first discussion topic will be the role of digital platforms and data for SME. And Marina Fernanda, I would like to, to ask you first, what do you hear from um, your constituents, basically, from the firms you represent at ICC? How do they work with digital platforms? Where are they beneficial for small and medium enterprises? Well, it is uh, for the development of a small and medium enterprises and also considering the micro enterprises, which is uh, it's very common in countries in Latin America as well as Africa and Asia. Uh, having access to, to the digital economy is extremely relevant. We have been hearing this morning, well, this afternoon, sorry, I'm still with a jet lag, <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that uh, there are, it's like we're living in, in two or three different worlds. We have some countries and companies that have gained full access, and, and we still have countries like mine that there are some communities that don't even have electricity, as, mm -hmm. as we were listening. So the challenges are enormous, but what, and, and they are in three levels. First of all is the access to the, to the internet. The other one is uh, having access to the platforms and having the, legal, the right frameworks for SMEs to negotiate with those platforms because they usually lack that the, the, the negotiating power, so they end up with not very good conditions. And on the third uh, part is, is to uh, have a proper training and, and skills on, on the owners of the SMEs and also the, their employees, because uh, employers, because uh, they, they, if they don't retrain constantly, they will, they will lose on, on the world. So I was talking of two different worlds because the challenges are on, on, on very different levels mm -hmm. and, and we have to address them accordingly to the needs of each country. Mm -hmm. But having learned from the past experience of, 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 of developed countries and use the best practices so we don't go and commit the same mistakes that have been committed all over the world. Okay, could you give an example what, uh, yes. what should be avoided? Well, <laughs> for instance, uh, we have a, a very small community in Mexico in the south border with Guatemala. There is a volcano there called the Tacana volcano. And there are growers, coffee growers, farmers, that have been growing uh, coffee there for centuries. But they, they, now they have electricity, but they don't have internet. They don't know nothing about the digital world. And they grow one of the best coffees because it's completely organical, natural, since they have never had the resources to use fertilizers or mm -hmm. a, any kind of, uh, of chemical additions to the land. But they can, uh, and their coffee is very well um, value, but not in Mexico, but in places like uh, Germany or Japan, it is very well value. But uh, we as a, as, a, as a business community try to support them and, and we uh, is, is install the computers in the school so children and adults can learn, but there was no internet. Okay. So those are the kinds of things that we need to avoid and work with the government. And even though they, they have been, we have been asking for the internet for many months now, it has not been installed yet. Okay, so, so we are really talking about enabling the community at all to work with the internet and not even um, building digital um, business models. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Sue, you have a similar experience. Um, uh, from what uh, ICAOR actually was emerging from or actually answering to. Explain a little bit how you uh, solved this problem with ICAO, this problem of the lack of uh, less electricity or other resources. Yes, please. Thank you for the question. And um, thank you all for staying. Um, we have to look like this to just make sure that we can make eye contact with the audience, but it's really great. Thank you all who are still in the room. So um, we, we look at um, connecting 
or using technology, any technology, as a tool to connect the people that are in, our, in the, or my constituents in my business. And my customers are farmers. We have, um, in Kenya alone, over 108,000 customers who are farmers. And the majority of them don't have smartphones and they don't have access to the internet, obviously, because they don't have smartphones. But what they do have in their hands is a device. They have a feature phone. Um, and what we've done is built a platform. The back end of the platform is cloud-based, so that component of it uses the internet. The front end is USSD-based, and we then are able to connect with the farmers through the telco and the telco systems and the telco platforms. Um, the farmers receive or use a, um, a USSD menu-based search to look for content that they need or to look for experts that they need. And we also have a... a it, would you call it online and offline, I guess, um, marketplace for farmers as well. Um, we talked about the issue around data and who owns the data and how do you protect that data, etc. So we clearly feel that when users come onto our platform through whatever mega platform they've had to come with, whether it's a platform that we're using as our cloud-based platform or whether it's a telco platform, but we feel that there are customers and that we protect the data for our customers, whereas some of the other platform owners feel that it's their customer and their data. So those are the kind of issues that we deal with. Oh, okay. Um, how does this um, work in, uh, when we talk of the classical large digital platforms? Pavel, maybe you, you can add on it. No, here's an, you can take this mic, please. So, so how do you work with uh, the large platforms to, in, in contrast? Have you, um, how, how do you benefit with Gaiwan uh, team manufacturers and what are critical or difficult things to solve? Yeah. Um, yeah, so thank you for your interest in the whole topic. And uh, yeah, Amazon, uh, when we are talking about large platforms, um, let's be specific, in Germany, um, the major platform is Amazon, and there is another platform, which is eBay. And there are other platforms, uh, but Amazon is dominating the market. So for us, for the Gaivan team manufacturer, um, Amazon has become a very important tool to reach customers and also to fulfill orders. Because Amazon gives you a, such a powerful tool that enables every small entrepreneur with not a big budget to launch a physical product. This is really important. The, uh, if we look back like 10 or 15 years ago, it was barely impossible. If you want to launch a product, if you want to create a physical product and sell it online, you need an online shop, you need um, a fulfiller, you, you need a warehousing, and all of that solves Amazon for many young uh, or small entrepreneurs. So this is quite a great launch pad to start your own business, but there are also challenges uh, and when the business becomes bigger and uses Amazon to quite a large extent, then this business needs more security, more reliability in case of any trouble with Amazon. Because there are sometimes, sometimes you can be switched off for some reason that is not really existing or there is no debate. Amazon is very easy on disabling businesses, and it happened to me as well. So just this year, just because of tax compliance check in the UK, by the way, we're selling not just in Germany, but also across Europe. So in the UK, we were offline for three months since August, and there were no discussion, and the end of the compliance check resulted in us paying virtually nothing, uh, like a few hundred bucks, which is, in, uh, it's too low of a amount for the penalty we received through being offline for three months. Mm -hmm. So actually there's some relation, right, in the kind of problem one can have, and it doesn't really matter whether you use a large digital platform or... Yeah, um, yeah well, if you, if you don't own the large digital, digital platform you have, you, and you depend on them, unfortunately there are some of those risks that come with those dependencies. Um, and they're not always easily solvable. We've walked away from very um, lucrative business um, because it, it just has been 
and out by our books ethically incorrect or um, you know unfair. Mm -hmm. But you are, of course, distributing knowledge, as you said, and information are not goods. So, Heike, how, how would you, um, uh, what, what, would you, what would be your comment to, to this um, challenge, really, to work with as a small enterprise with large platforms? Well, I think uh, what we just established already in the discussion is that huge platform businesses um, enable small and medium-sized companies to make use of economies of scale, right? So, um, by definition, as a small and medium-sized enterprise, I don't, I am not able to realize economies of scale in terms of very efficient logistic infrastructure, for example, um, access to a broad customer base. So, um, this is something that's really attractive for SMEs, and this is the reason why many SMEs start cooperating or working together with digital platforms. And I think that the uh, disadvantages of this business relation only evolves over time. So only in time, as an SME, I realized that I would like to make use of my own data, right? That I establish a, a more complex business model where I really want to or which should be based on, on, uh, on a broader uh, data uh, usage of data. So I think that um, the challenge is that uh, nowadays platform businesses have become so powerful, especially in accumulation of data, that we need to discuss new approaches in cooperation between SMEs and platform businesses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how do you promote those um, uh, cooperations at ICC? We heard a little bit earlier from John Denton already, but can you explain more on that? Yes, uh, uh, data flowing data flowing right now is one of the, the biggest risks that we are facing, and if the, the impact for SMEs is tremendously. Uh, John just mentioned uh, the moratorium of the WTO. This started in 1989. Mm -hmm. as, as, a, as a pledge, uh, an agreement to, for, of countries not to in, impose electronic uh, uh, taxes or, or, or tariffs for, for electronic transmissions. And it has been renewed every, every two years, every year at the WTO conference. But there are three, many countries, small countries, uh, a small group of countries, basically. Uh, among them are Indonesia, India, and South Africa that have identified a problem with uh, uh, electronic commerce, which mm -hmm. is that there are some goods that like uh, programs and books and music, uh, movies, that are now not paying taxes uh, mm -hmm. in, in customs right now. So they, they as, as usual, governments do, they, they said, we need to, to bring this up to date, so let's pay taxes on that. But we're not considering that data transmission is also emails and text messages and a lot of things that SMEs use every day, and that would also be, be taxated. Really? Yes. So, so the, the data itself, a the data, data exa exactly, not, not the goods. Not the goods. Many of the tax laws that are in discussion here in Europe are trying to tax the goods. The moratorium is about data. So the problem is that this ends on December 31st of this year. Mm -hmm. and, and if we don't do enough to our, so our countries can hear us, this will go on because of the situation the WTO is, mm -hmm. is right now. So if you allow me, I would like to invite whatever the people is now left in the audience to please contact your governments and let them know how important it is to continue with the moratorium, especially if you're from one of those countries yeah. that want it to end. Okay, and um, since you are um, interested in trade and, uh, and a good ecosystem for um, SMEs too, so what's your solution to this problem of um, lacking um, the funding really for public, public goods or resources that are needed uh, for digitization of well, def uh, enterprises? Definitely cannot be a, a only left to governments. That's what uh, private investment is so, so important. On this, uh, going back to the example I give you to, of the of the farmers uh, in 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 the south of Mexico in Chiapas, there are there are thousands of commu small communities like the one we're supporting 
but we cannot do it by ourselves. It has to be the government as well and, and civil society if we want to bring uh, these people up to the 20th century or 21st century because they are still living like in the 17th century. Mm -hmm. so, so we really need to work together and, and definitely governance, governments are not able and have not been able to, 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 to have them make the investments needed. But what they are able to do is to bring up to date the laws, not going into a lot of detail in the laws, because that's a problem with parliaments that we were, we're hearing about it. They want to go and they don't realize that uh, on, 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 on internet and, and digital, uh, things are moving so fast that you need to, to, to legislate more, more openly mm -hmm. and, and more into the concepts than into the detail because if you go into the detail, you're handcuffing the evolution of, of the process itself. Mm -hmm. uh, what's your comment, what's your opinion on that, on regulation too much, not enough? Um, how, how much regulation is healthy for small and medium enterprises, medium-sized enterprises? Well, um, to be honest, I'm not a big fan about regulation, especially in the context of internet. I think that maybe to maybe we can talk about a specific point. Um, we just um, we're starting to, to to talk about the problem of data ownership, right? And this is one area where I would say, well, regulation might be useful but um, only in a very specific way. So what's the problem here? The problem is um, that when we talk about data ownership, uh, data is owned, owned by the entities who collect it, not the ones it originates from. And this is one aspect where I think that regulation can be helpful in order to give back the powers and give back the ownership of data to the entities, to the people uh, it originates from. Uh, another problem especially when we talk about platforms and data ownership, is that um, data is usually stored in centralized databases, which makes them very prone to be hacked. And this is a problem because, um, of course, we saw it in 2018, Facebook, Google, and so on. This is also a problem for the user because it, it's, it uh, attacks the privacy and um, yeah, the user privacy. So I think that in terms of data ownership, regulations might be helpful even to produce more innovation because it's a, it changes the circumstances for innovation. But other than that, I'm not a huge fan of regulation. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay, then let's stick maybe a little bit um, um, uh, with data ownership. So you are an entrepreneur and you want to um, get direct contacts to your customers or don't you? Do you get the data of your customers? Do you get enough data of your customers when you use online platforms for distribution? For yes, selling, so actually, it's not only distribution but selling. This is quite an interesting question. I think, uh, first of all, uh, just recently uh, we got GDPR, which improved the rights of the data owners, so of the customers particularly, um, uh, severely. So you can, for example, from, from Amazon or for any other provider, you can get the information what data is stored and you can even ask for deleting the whole data about you. Mm -hmm. And by law, they, are, uh, they have to, to follow your Bidding, so you, they have really to delete the data. Um, then the the most important thing and the most expensive thing today for online business is coverage or reach. So, Sorry, reach. Reach, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you want to reach customers, uh, and people buy customers using advertisement. Advertisement has gotten extremely expensive. You often pay per click, and many users uh, who have, uh, do not run a business and um, consequentially do not pay for advertisement, they are unaware that a click on Google AdWords may cost two euros or three euros or even five euros and above. So just one click without a sale. And this is this is something that companies are willing to pay to get sales and uh, 
as a consequence of a sale, customers' data to send them um, personalized advertisement and to sell goods to these customers. So Amazon invested, uh, well, again, Amazon is a, an important platform for us. We also have an online shop, but this is more for B2B customers. So many uh, private customers buy on Amazon from us. And Amazon has invested a lot to get customers' data. They provide extreme service. It is very easy to return a product to Amazon if you don't like it. Um, and they are certainly interested in protecting the data from this perspective. So it is not about data protection for data protection itself, so like privacy. No, it is an investment protection. They don't want me to use this data for my own advertisement. So on Amazon specifically, all email addresses of customers are encrypted. It is an encrypted string at Amazon.de, so if I send a message to a customer, Amazon monitors every message I send out. So if I excessively contact customers, they will ask me to stop that or ban the account. So they, um, they use an extreme control over how I communicate with customers. Although I get the full address because uh, the contract is between customer and us and my company, so we have to write them invoices, and an invoice contains the full address of a customer. I'm not allowed to use this address to send them advertisement, like physical letters. So, um, and from my perspective, it's not very much the protection of customers' data, it is more of a protection of reach investment from Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you still profit, uh, you, you, you use the platform still because it's a uh, sure. useful, useful thing. Yes. So you, you keep enough, in other words. Yes, yes, for sure. Can I just ask you a question then? So what would happen if, for some odd reason, your ties with Amazon were severed and all your customers are on the other side of the wall, as it were, you'd then have to reach out to them through physical means? I'm just a, just, just a you know... So if, if Amazon suspends the account, what happens then? Your account. What happens to yes. all your customers? So by terms of service, so there is, um, a uni we have to separate. There is terms of service uh, of Amazon, their own rules, and there is the legislation, the law of a country where Amazon operates. So by terms of service of Amazon, I'm not allowed to use this data to contact customers. Although, according to GDPR, I'm also not allowed to use customers' data for contacting them. So if Amazon suspends the account for whatever reason, this is the risk I have to take. Mm -hmm. they, they can shut down the business, and I would really welcome if, uh, if some laws or some regulations will be in place to protect businesses from this kind of operation from Amazon. Because Amazon is a huge company, they are service-oriented, they are process-oriented. You cannot run a, such a huge company without processes. However, if something happens without these processes, uh, outside of those processes, um, they are very inefficient. It is very hard mm. to get in contact with somebody on Amazon. And even if you get in contact, this person often does not know what to do because they have no clear um, plan of action how to handle this kind of situation. And I'm speaking from my experience with this, uh, uh, with this suspension in the UK. It was not, not such a huge deal for us because uh, we are mainly selling in, in Germany, but still, uh, it was a great experience to see what happens if you If you were selling thousands and thousands of dollars a day, it would have been massive. Yes, yes, absolutely. Okay, um, let's go back to the, to, to the framework a little bit. And uh, we heard a lot earlier that, well, yeah, that's a, you know, just finding out what, what could help and would, uh, would be able to, how one can be able to improve the situation to the benefits um, uh, for the small and medium-sized companies. Uh, we heard a lot of um, earlier um, 
um, interest in building decentralized platforms and maybe uh, going to business organizations or trade associations or so for uh, enabling, establishing, promoting decentralized platforms like self-managed um, self or so. What would you say to this, or have you already started doing something like this? Uh, John was mentioning uh, in, in the previous uh, panel, he, he talked about the development of blockchains uh, for, for mm -hmm. trade purposes, especially f thinking on small and medium enterprises. The ICC, uh, I believe, has the International Chamber of Commerce, although let me say that we're not really a Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> That's a name because we started in 1919. But it, what we have been looking since the beginning is to provide the tools for, for businesses to really engage in global trade. From the known uh, international trade uh, commercial terms, the INCO terms, that everybody that is into exporting business uses every day, that it's something that, that can portray what we foresee as the future of, for, for, for the SMEs and, and all companies going into, into, into e-trade. E and when the, since the INCO terms were developed in 1935, they are developed by the companies that use the international trade itself, mm -hmm. by the specialists. And they are reviewed every 10 years. Every 10 years we get together, we, we hear from the users, we hear from our members, and we up, up, update the rules every 10 years. Mm -hmm. We're much faster than governments legislating, definitely. And this is what we see for the future. That's what John was talking about, the blockchains. We, we believe that by creating uh, this um, uh, entity that is uh, independent as, as being part of the ICC, small and medium companies will access uh, blockchains that will allow them to to fulfill the requirements of today's markets. Uh, customers want to know that you are respecting human rights, that you are conducting your business in a respectful way to, to environment and, and inclu inclusivity and, and all that. And the only way you can prove to them without a higher cost is the use of blockchain. And that, that's kind of the things that we're looking into the future. But you've not really started yet. You well, yeah, we, we have already started the, 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 the launch of it, and, and we're just uh, kind of testing it in, in Singapore okay. right now. Yes, okay. it's already started. OK, so, so next time we'll meet, we'll, we'll hear a little, hear yeah. a little bit Hopefully. already about how, how it, it just started last October. <laughs> OK, yes, October. So do you have advice, uh, Heike, for uh, blockchain, um, uh, building a blockchain ecosystem? Because I know you've uh, done research on this and worked on this. So what is necessary to make this um, um, technology successful? So there are several things we, uh, we can talk about. Um, prior to that, I would like to add something uh, to our discussion about uh, GDPR and regulation, because I think that GDPR is a perfect example for uh, regulation went wrong. Because if we, look at, um, <laughs> if we look at the implementation phase in Germany, um, first of all, we know from studies that 90% of the users admit that they don't read terms and conditions, right? Everybody just clicks it away. So it's a regulation meant to, um, to educate or to, to, uh, to, to increase the level of security and knowledge for the users, but users most of the time just don't behave the way we think they do, we anticipate they do. So this is a very complex regulation system and it just, you know, I think it's, it's the right, it, it's the wrong way to approach the problem. And decentralized technologies can be a better way to approach the problem of um, massive data ownership with our platform businesses. Uh, and um, in order to especially enable small and medium-sized companies to make use of decentralized technologies in the future, I think, first of all, we need to establish self-sovereign identities because we need to enable mm -hmm. the user to address uh, decentralized business solutions. We need to enable the user to, uh, like, for example, um, order something from a decentralized Amazon, right, where every small and medium-sized uh, company can sell their products, but not on a platform business. And because of that, we just... Decentralized solutions are um, 
first of all, start with the infrastructure, and this is something that needs to establish needs to be established first before small and medium-sized enterprises can make use of it. Mm -hmm. um, go back to data, um, general data protection uh, once more. Um, isn't this a, a, a tool or a law actually uh, that gives a lot of trust, which is so necessary, and what, what we've heard before? I mean, isn't it uh, good so that uh, customers can trust um, the online markets and uh, other um, agencies or so they um, uh, access on the internet? I don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm happy to admit that I also don't read terms and conditions. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but, yeah but because you don't have to, because you know that there's a basic uh, protection, no? Of your data? Well, yes, there's a basic protection, but still, you know, if you agree to terms and conditions, mm -hmm. you, you might agree that your data will be accumulated, stored, sold, whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, would yeah. Like. yes, please. Um, so, uh, I agree, I totally agree with you. By the way, we we checked in our online shop uh, the behavior of customers, and uh, we found out that especially German customers, do read the Impressum and do, I mean, <laughs> relatively often regard, uh, compared to other countries and read also um, in terms of services. So, um, yes, the GDPR has definitely its drawbacks. For example, this cookie uh, hint that you have to click away every time. It doesn't make sense because every website uses cookies. It is necessary. It is a state of the art. You cannot have a website without cookies by the, uh, uh, today's standards. So uh, one important thing about this whole regulation and reading is that many people, even in the e-commerce space, neglect the value of time, of customers' times. They just see the money. But the money is not the only value the customer gives to a provider. Time is a much greater value, from my perspective, because uh, to, to, to read something, to um, look at the product, to communicate with the product by reading about it and watching videos, it is time, at lifetime of the customers, which you cannot buy for money. And then at the end of it, the customer might exchange money for the product. So uh, time is a very important currency in today's e-commerce. And you also know those three seconds rules that if the, the video does not appeal within three seconds, uh, people click away. And if you completely neglect time as currency, this kind of regulations appear like you have to read terms of services. Nobody has time to read that. At least if you buy a product for 10 euros, you, you don't want to invest your time. If you buy a product or service for a four-figure amount or five-figure amount, for sure you will read the terms of services. Thank you. I would like to address another topic that relates to possibilities of cooperation among small and medium-sized um, enterprises, uh, which is sharing knowledge and sharing maybe even the knowledgeable uh, scientists, data experts, or even software, shared software. And um, you work with Magento, which is an open source software. Um, do you feel that it has a... Um, uh, that it has a very good appeal or that is very helpful for small and medium sized enterprises? Can everybody use it? Well, can everybody use it is quite a tricky question <laughs> because it is free, it is open source, although there is also a uh, version for money, but it is also quite complex and challenging. So the consequence of it being free and everybody can learn Magento and developing Magento uh, gives a market a huge number of providers, of service providers. So you don't have to be a licensed service provider and pay money to some organization. You just can learn Magento and open your services for money as a freelancer or as an agency or any other organized group. And this is certainly very helpful for businesses to launch an e-commerce project. However, there are also shops for rental fee of like 20 euros per month, 
which you can also use for the start. Because if you use Magento, you will pay at least 50 or even more uh, euros per month just for the server, although the, the ser software is for free. Okay. Okay. So we need uh, different levels for entry for a small, medium. Yes, it depends. Yes. It depends. Uh, Sue, you have actually developed your own uh, technology behind your service platform. Uh, how did you manage to do that? Did you get any help? Did you have uh, any kind of shared software or so? So, you know, when I'm listening to people speak here, I'm not a techie. I own a tech company and I know very little about technology, but I do have a product that is, dry, is, is um, delivered over to using technology. Um, I look for the right people. Um, I got together um, a team of people and I told them what I wanted and we started to build it. We built it and broken it many times. Um, our strategic partners are Accenture, so they help our team as well. Um, and recently we actually have also engaged a development team in India. So for me, technology is just the means of delivering our product. Mm -hmm. um, so like I'm saying, there's a lot of um, tech stuff that I'm going to be hearing here that I'm just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but on the other hand, you have a very, uh, a very well working tool there. Yeah. Uh, could you imagine well, licensing? Exactly. Well, Even yeah, eventually, yes. yes. Because um, maybe we need a little bit to explain more. You, you are really helping people that don't have internet access. Yeah. They have access to some kind of technology, but not to the internet. So, so. Exactly. So the tool that we've built is um, it's language agnostic, it's content agnostic, it's country agnostic, and it can be used for anything. It can be used to educate farmers in agriculture. It can be used as a medical tool. Um, there are various services within the tool, so it's not just um, educating per se, there's also connecting um, users with experts on the ground, there's also connecting, like I'm saying, through the marketplace. Um, we have dabbled with the idea of looking at one of our revenue streams much further down the line as um, software as a service. Um, I, I sound like I, I, I know what I'm talking about, okay. don't I? You sound yeah. wonderful. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So that's one of the things we're thinking about, but right now my passion is scaling the agricultural perspective of it across Africa. And I have um, committed the next, possibly the next six months, so that's all we're going to do in terms of trying to get the, the numbers across Africa and access across Africa. And that means working with governments, it means working with telcos, it means, um, you know, a lot of my focus can't be on something that is, is it great to think about later as a revenue stream, but right now, that's what we want to do, that's our core. That's, um, what we, okay. yeah. So before we have the questions from the audience, I, I would like to address to you all um, the question, how, how, what would be good tools beyond what we've discussed and um, to, to empower small and medium-sized enterprises to really bring, make their voices heard in internet governance processes? What, what have we learned so far? And we will have more questions and so on, but what do you think are good, good tools you've experienced? What has helped? Well, first of all, uh, and the reason why I started participating in, in business organizations is because you need to have a, a stable environment in, in your countries to develop any kind of a size company, but especially for SMEs we need to have a, a, a proper rule of law mm -hmm. and the certainty that the rules that are applying today will continue in the future. Because in some of our countries, you know, anytime, every time we have a different government, they decided that they are going to review whatever the previous governments have done and they change everything. Mm -hmm. And there is no way that a, a, a business can grow yeah. with that kind of, of changes. And, and certainly the rule of law and stop corruption for most of our countries are extremely important to develop all kinds of businesses. So, so you would say that your engagement and business organization was to bring some stability? Well, I was trying to understand what was going on in my country in the 1980s, so okay. that's, that's why I started. But also, uh, we also need to bring access, uh, better access for, for investment 
and trade for small and medium enterprises, better access to finance opportunities. The financial markets today are, are kind of more, have forgotten what the original trade of goods was. So it is very, very difficult to access uh, uh, financing for producing actual real products mm -hmm. and to try to sell them. Okay, so, so you need to build bridges between, you know, as, as a Chamber of Commerce or other business organizations need to build bridges between the different stakeholders, yes, basically. Definitely. It has to be a multi-stakeholder effort. Uh, okay, at the, at the local and regional yes. level, okay. Yeah, well, I, uh, I totally agree, of course, because uh, small and medium-sized uh, enterprises, they ju just don't have the time and the resources to be engaged and invested themselves. They don't have the time to do lobbying, for example. So, uh, yes, we need, we need uh, alliances in order to make their voices heard. And also we need innovation in order to solve technical problems if uh, the problem of a data accumulation in platform businesses is a problem of technology. We need better technology to solve it. So uh, this is something else, innovation and, and uh, driving forces, yeah. And what are the stakeholders that, that have proven uh, most efficient in those um, um, building, in, in building connections and, and coming together? I mean, you, you've done this research and, and could you say that, that there's a special constellation that was helpful? Like, I mean, we had Accenture even here, so it was a d d different kind of stakeholders. Well, by, by stakeholder, you mean intermediaries or is... Different kinds. So it can, it can be intermediaries, it can be policy, it can be business associations, it can be large business uh, helping small business, all kinds. Science can be very helpful. Well, science, if science... Uh is supposed to be helpful. I think science needs to communicate on an easier level. So I think the problem with science most of the time is that it's just so far away from the re reality of small and medium-sized companies. So in order for research institutes to be helpful, and they can, I, I think in, uh, for example, building use cases, we need to focus more on the really like the the, the prominent problems of SMEs and uh, not the general questions and the general discussions. Yeah. Okay. Now, Andrea, please. You wanted to add something. Yeah, I just wanted, if you don't mind, I just think that, um, and, and, and I guess just being here and, and, and seeing some of the huge big gaps between the speed of the way um, the internet and access to the web is moving. And I mean, even the question that came in from our parliamentarian earlier where he said, you know, what are they supposed to do to whatever? I think that one of the things in the developing um, world that we should start looking at is creating more forums where the different ecosystems can actually get together and have discussions mm -hmm. and making those, actually embedding those into part of business and part of, of government so that we have the conversation, so that we're not hearing, uh, uh, getting answers over Twitter and, <laughs> you, know, you know what I'm saying? So we actually have dialogue in country uh, around the issues, but um, a very, very focused dialogue on some of the issues so that we can, um, again, and, and uh, it was mentioned earlier around, I think it was, I'm not sure if it was Tim or somebody else talked about some of the, the policies and things that, or regulations that should, should not be so stringent that they actually stifle innovation. I believe that innovation should come before regulation. If you look at what happened in Kenya with M-Pesa, and we all know the M-Pesa story across Africa, it was actually innovation that came before regulation, but the innovators were giants. When those giants talked to government, government listened. When you've got smaller, medium-sized businesses where you've got great innovation, how do they get heard? And I think that having dialogue um, and creating spaces for dialogue and forums should, should help. Can I dro drop some, it's more or less speed dating questions for the beginning. The one is, do you think, a uh, quick answer, that offline and online commerce will ultimately coexist or the e-commerce will determine commerce in the future? I think that common sense wins and things that require to be offline, like tea, <laughs> it will never go completely online or clothing. If you buy clothes, certainly you can send it back, but you still want to, to try it out. So things that you want to experience offline, they will still have presence in the offline world. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk from my constituents, things like cows and chickens and eggs. 
Yeah. Not yet. If they come from the 3D printer, let's see. No, that, that will all be traded offline and in whatever it is. It's not going to be something that you're going to be trading really online. I, I truly believe that what you just said about the experience, the experience of, of, of the purchase begins when, when you decide that you want to purchase something. Mm -hmm. And the experience that you in the future will have when you go to a store is very different than when you just click on your, on your computer. So it's about the full experience. And that's where there are a lot of opportunities for SMEs to really grant a different experience to customers that will make them go back to their stores. Mm -hmm. I have another speed dating question, which is electronic commerce. Do you think it's a panacea for SMEs or a threat? Which means, is it a curse or a blessing? Just kneeling it down. How would you answer? <laughs> I put it again. Electronic commerce, is it a curse for SMEs or a blessing? So is it the best or the worst, or is, is it a ridiculous question? Electronic commerce is simply a tool. So it depends on how you use this tool and it makes definitely many things efficient or more efficient than they were previously without e-commerce. And it is not suitable for every business. So for example, if you sell big machinery or pipes made of plastic, I don't think that an online shop will help growing your business. It also, or cows or chickens, yeah. I'm yeah that. You need to make sure that your customer base is, is up to what you try to apply. I remember in 2002, I, 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 I heard about business to business platforms and I was so excited to know that the one that we were using in our company will allow us to, bring, to, to do it with our distributors. But you have to understand that in, I have two different type of cost of, of the distributors. The big ones like the Walmarts and, and the Home Depots and that kind of people, but also the small store, mom and papa hardware store. And I try to bring them into the business to business and, and for as long as I explain and I keep on telling them, this will be great because from your computer you don't need to wait for a sales guy. You can see our inventory. You can, and I went over and over and they were, what are you talking? It was like I was talking Japanese to them. <laughs> so you, you need to understand your customers and where they are at and although you can ha have access to the technology that you know that it will help them if they're not ready they're not ready yeah and I, I agree and I also think that infrastructure is hugely important as well because mm. you we have um, e-commerce uh, commerce happening in Kenya but it takes six days for something to come and that time you would have yeah, gone we to the had store that yesterday too yeah so you know if your roads don't work if it's raining if the distribution system has, you know, you have to rely on so many people and each one of them, if they've got issues, it's a risk to your brand and your business. And maybe we shouldn't forget that many, many, many SMEs um, don't um, trade goods, but produce goods. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, like you, you, you're not going to, to bring your plumbing devices um, to, on, on, uh, via e-commerce solutions to your clients. I know. You, you, in the end, you will need to have somebody installing it. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and although we, we do work on videos and training on the internet so people can do it themselves because that's yeah. the main part of it, still there's a lot of people that will want a plumber to go in. Yes, yeah. okay. Yeah. I understand. <laughs> okay. Another question is, um, with the developments of artificial intelligence, how are SMEs supposed to compete with the giants like Google and Amazon that have a head start in AI, artificial intelligence, and customer data? What do you think, Heike? I don't think this is a speed dating question. No, no, no. I, I didn't put that up front. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a Maybe. tough one. I, I should have. It's a tough one, yeah. It is. It, it's a tough one, yes. Uh, I don't know. Um, I, I, I think all those concepts like blockchain and AI and so on are so far away from the, uh, I, I already said this a couple of minutes ago, are so far away from the actual problems small and medium-sized companies have. I don't know if complex AI solutions are necessary for every SME. So um, I, I think the important first steps for SMEs to be able to make use of those complex technologies in the future is to be fully uh, digitized. So they need to um, 
need to learn how to uh, grasp the data, how to process data first before we can talk about making use of artificial, artificial intelligence and things like that. So I think it's, this is so far away from the reality right now, so yeah. Okay. Yes. I think that this whole topic of artificial intelligence and neural networks, the naming supposedly or make it seem like it is something like human would do or humans will think, but it is nothing like. It's just an automation on another level. It's a, just a certain level of algorithms. For example, neural networks are just a multiplication of huge matrices. It's just math. This has nothing to do with neural network in my brain. So it helps certainly to make adaptable solutions. So the solution is not rigid, but can sort of learn, quote unquote. But it is nothing to be afraid like Hollywood films show us, like uh, robots will conquer the world or something. It's just a different level of automation. And I think that artificial intelligence, for example, in language processing is very important and very helpful. For example, for uh, uh, regarding the previous question, how to communicate with government. There are too many people to be heard, but with artificial intelligence, you kind of can process all the question at once and see what topic is most is the most popular among people uh, and look close into it. And you can also automate customer service at least at certain level with artificial intelligence. I think that's within reach of uh, SMEs. Yes, absolutely. And as always, if you have a complex technology, there will be a service provider which will make it easy for SMEs and other entrepreneurs to access that. So for example, Magento is also quite a complex technology and you will not learn it over the weekend or with a few days of training. Um, you will have to, to buy a service provider who will develop or modify the shop for you. Okay. The next question, um, how do we make sure that the employees of SMEs can use and operate these digital tools and platforms? Will it be further education? Will it be funding? You touched on this earlier. Okay, yes. Uh, as I mentioned before, for instance, the International Chamber of Commerce developed the INCO terms. So, so companies will know exactly when they own the products and how are they going to ship it and who is responsible for, 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 for the freight and, and for the uh, safety issues, etc. So, we, we need to train the users of, of, of these tools. And what we do is we have a, an ICC Academy in Singapore, which is all e-learning and has all kinds of programs for, for companies from banking using how to use the, 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 the finance trading and how to, to, to fill up the papers correctly because that's a lot of uh, problem for smaller companies of to the use of, uh, of the, the, the INCO terms and all kinds of, of uh, learning that, that the people in small and medium companies need to have when they start trading uh, in, in export matters. We also, for many years, we, in 1923, we created the International Court of Arbitration for all uh, dispute uh, in between uh, companies in, in, in a trade agreement and also companies need to learn about that and especially small and medium companies that do not have resources they need to have access to for instance model contracts and that is something that we also promote in line and any company can access those model contracts that will work on their country because they are written in a world that all legislation will fit in. So, so we see that it's very important to have business organizations who take care of that. I think we also need incentive models for SMEs to educate their employees because we have opportunity costs, huge opportunity costs for SMEs. So I think this is something the government can do to come up with incentive schemes in order to ensure the continuous education of employees in SMEs. Yeah. Sue, what are you doing? You told us earlier a little bit about um, further education for your clients, for your... Yeah, so when I look at what um, 
you know, the first steps for anyone to use something, whether it's a, you know, a product or a service, it's got to be easy. It's got to be. You've got to have as, as low a, a barrier as possible for an entry. Um, we were very lucky, and we're building over USSD, and preceding that was M-Pesa, which actually got everyone in that space and able to use USSD-operated menus. So we just built along the same kind of pathway, um, and it's fairly easy entry points. So I would say, but within our market space, where the farmers are the SMEs themselves, they have their own businesses and they trade, um, it just has to be really easy. And again, there again, if we aim and we focus on things that are who have to be so easy that we don't have to get into expensive boots on the ground or other teaching. Okay, so um, actually you had the last word or uh, earlier saying that um, to help SMEs you should, we should create an ecosystem of dialogue and I think all of you will agree. We have a wonderful last uh, speed dating question. In 10 or 20 years, will there be still 95% of all enterprises be SMEs? Yes or no, Sue? In 20 years? Oh, yeah, for sure. Vast majority. <laughs> sure. Pavel? I think so, yeah. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Absolutely, because we, we will have awesome decentralized solutions and then SMEs <laughs> will be stronger again. Yeah. So maybe even more than 95%. <laughs> Thank you so much. Discussing this uh, wonderful, interesting question here on SMEs and Internet governments. Thank you for you listening to us, following us uh, with the ups and downs of platforms and data ownership and uh, um, yeah, funding and uh, education. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you for this, for this very optimistic ending. <laughs> yes, it is. I think it is. And I, I feel we have all the reason to do so, to be optimistic. Just <laughs> we were, the, I think the question was not if 95% of, of the companies will be SMEs, but the percentage of the GDP, global GDP, that SMEs will bring to the yeah. world. And I hope that's higher than the 60% today. Very important aspect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you very much. We tried our best on, uh, uh, on yeah, gender, more gender equality through the day. Um, I, and that was an interesting remark on the web, and I wanted to share it with you, because somebody said the, uh, the MC, which should be me, is wrong. It's not about diversity and inclusion on panels. It's about the question of diversity and inclusion in the systematic uh, behind. So who are the opinion leaders and the decision makers? To set. So that, for me, was an interesting uh, uh, remark out of the community. So thank you all very much for this incredible attention span. So uh, we don't have beds here to stay tonight, but we have a very nice social hub outside <laughs> to stay for longer. So thank you very much for joining, uh, and please spread the word outside, online. Thank you very much. Thank you all.